Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs. And I'm pleased to welcome you all to today's panel called Deconstructing the Truism of Race as a Social Construct with philosophers Naomi Zak, Rebecca Tuval, and Dermot Costello. Today's panel is in conjunction with the exhibition Adrian Piper, A Synthesis of, Institu of Intuitions, 1965 to 2016, which opened at the Hammer last month. The exhibition is the result of a four-year collaboration between the artist, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the Hammer Museum, and it's the most comprehensive retrospective of Piper's work to date. I hope you've all had a chance to see the exhibition upstairs. Today's program is presented with the support of the Museum of Modern Art, and we want to express our thanks to visionary women for their support of the Adrian Piper exhibition and for this program as well. Before we begin, I want to invite you all to return and see the exhibition again. Uh, admission is free and the museum is open until 8 p.m. on weeknights and 5 p.m. on weekends. Also, we have a series of artists and scholars leading very subjective walkthroughs of the exhibition on Thursday evenings at 6 p.m. And in December, we'll have three Sundays of workshops in which we'll, um, participants will be invited to read some of Adrian Piper's essays and to view specific works of art in the galleries. And then we'll gather seminar style and have a sort of deeper discussion of some of her works. And you can find out more about all of these programs on the Hammer website. Today's panel was originally intended as part of a larger symposium on Adrian Piper's work, but due to scheduling conflicts, it's being held as a separate program. The rest of the symposium happened on October 7th, and the video of the symposium is available on the Hammer website. Much of Adrian Piper's work challenges conceptions of race, of race. <laughs> And the intent of this program is to discuss some of the complexity of racial identity in more detail within the rigorous philosophical framework of Adrian Piper's academic practice. While this program was organized in close collaboration with Adrian Piper, the Hammer hosts many programs about race and identity, and this event is one of a multifaceted, continuing dis discussion of a complex subject. Today's program borrows from a format used widely in the field of philosophy. Our three philosophers have been asked to respond to four artworks by Adrian Piper, as well as two of her written works. The format you will find is somewhat unusual. So first, philosopher Naomi Zak will read a paper she's written in response to our invitation. Then philosopher Rebecca Tuval will read a critique of Naomi Zak's paper. And then Zak will have an opportunity to respond to Tuval's critique. Um, and then Rebecca Tuvel will um, present her paper responding to the works by Adrian Piper, and Naomi Zak will have an opportunity to present her critique, and then Tuvel will be able to respond to Zak's critique. And then finally, philosopher Dermot Costello will give his own response to Adrian's work and his response to Zak and Tuvel, and then we'll take audience questions. The entire program will be around two or two and a half hours, and keeping that in mind, I want to let you know that. Uh, out in the courtyard, you can purchase coffee and sandwiches. Um, and there's also a water fountain and restrooms right across the courtyard. So I'm going to quickly show you the works from the exhibition that our panelists have been invited to respond to so that you'll know what they're talking about. And then I'll give you a brief bio of each of the panelists. Um, the first artwork is this drawing called Self-Portrait Exaggerating My Negroid Features. And this is from 1981. And you'll see this referred to many times. We're going to have these images on rotation in the background, so you'll be able to see them again. Um, the second is this work called Cornered, which is a video installation with birth certificates on either side of the video, single channel video, and then a table facing the viewer and chairs. The third is called Self-Portrait as a Nice White Lady from 1995. The fourth artwork is called Thwarted Projects, Dashed Hopes, A Moment of Embarrassment from 2012. And because we'll be discussing this a lot, uh, I'll let you see the text in more detail and read this out loud. Dear friends, for my 64th birthday, I've decided to change my racial and nationality designations. Henceforth, my new racial designation will be neither black nor white, but rather 6.25% gray, honoring my 1 16th African heritage. And my new nationality designation will be not African American, but rather Anglo-German American, reflecting my preponderantly English and German ancestry. Please join me in celebrating this exciting new adventure in pointless administrative precision and futile institutional control. Signed, Adrian Piper, September 20th, 2012. 
Uh, she also wrote this book called um, Escape to Berlin, a travel memoir, which we'll be discussing, and this essay called Passing for White, Passing for Black in 1992. This essay is available um, on the Adrian Piper Research Foundation website. So now I'm going to quickly introduce our speakers, and then we can get started. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Naomi Zak, a professor of philosophy at the University of Oregon. She just published a new book called Reviving the Social Compact, Inclusive Citizenship, Inclusive Citizenship in an Age of Extreme Politics. Other recent books include her edited 51 essay, Oxford Handbook on Philosophy and Race from 2017, and Philosophy of Race and Introduction in 2018. Her monographs include the theory of applicative justice, an empirical pragmatic approach to correcting racial injustice, white privilege and black rights, the injustice of US police racial profiling and homicide, the ethics and mores of race, of race <laughs> equality after the history of philosophy, ethics for disaster, and inclusive feminism, a third wave theory of women's commonality, and philosophy of science and race. Zach has spoken widely and published numerous articles on these subjects and her earlier work about mixed race. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Rebecca Tuvel, Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. She specializes in ethics, feminist philosophy, and philosophy of race. Her current work focuses on the metaphysical and moral possibility of transracialism, or transitioning from membership in one racial category to another. And then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Dermot Costello, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Warwick in England, where he convenes the Masters in Philosophy and the Arts and co-directs the Center for Research in Philosophy, Literature, and the Arts. He's a past chair of the British Society of Aesthetics and a past recipient of a Humanities Research Council Award for an interdisciplinary project on the aesthetics of photography. He works across analytic and continental approaches to aesthetics with particular interest in post-Kantian German tradition, recent analytic philosophy of photography, and post-1960s art history and theory. He wrote the book On Photography, A Philosophical Inquiry in 2017, and he's currently working on a second book called Values in Contemporary Art and, Philosophy and Photography. His essay, Xenophobia, Stereotypes, and Empirical Acculturation, Neo-Kantianism in Adrian Piper's Performative Conceptual Art, recently appeared in the collection called Adrian Piper, A Reader, published by MoMA to coincide with her current retrospective. So now please join me in welcoming Dr. Naomi Zak. Thank you for being here and welcome. And I hope that you don't get bored, and I don't think you will, because there's a lot of contention in philosophical dialogue. <laughs> so um, I thank Adrian Piper for inviting me to this dialogue, and Claudia Bester, Janini Subramanian, Alison Lambert, and others uh, with whom I've not been in contact at the Hammer Museum for coordinating this event. I accepted because I thought it was interesting, and the museum has been generous. I also welcome the opportunity to experience a wider context for the part of Pop Piper's general introduction to rationality and the structure of the self, which I published. I published a part of the initial introduction that I published in my 2000 edited anthology, Women of Color and Philosophy. In June of this year, Claudia emailed me, and I'm going to quote, specifically, Piper suggested a dialogue between you and Rebecca Tuval about her artworks specifically interrogating racial identity such as, and I'm going to just uh, list the artworks that we're talking about again, and they will be, as Claudia said, uh, continually displayed on the screen. Self-Portrait, Exaggerating My Negroid Features, 1981. Cornered, 1988. Self-Portrait as a Nice White Lady, 1995. Thwarted Projects, Dashed Hopes, A Moment of Embarrassment, 2012. And 
uh, for her texts, Passing for White, Passing for Black, 1992, and the book, Escape to Berlin, a travel memoir, 2018. I was already somewhat familiar with Piper's artwork, and a few days after the, the invitation I received from the Hammer, I saw Concepts and Intuitions, the retrospective exhibition of her work from 1965 to 2016, which occupied the entire sixth floor of MoMA. As I understand it, for this panel, uh, Rebecca Tuval and I are to read papers and comment on each other's. So this panel thereby has the structure uh, of a panel at an academic philosophy conference. But it is being video recorded as part of an art exhibit. To me, this means that what I say is part of this iteration of concepts and intuitions as designed by Adrian Piper. As an academic philosopher, it is not difficult for me to write and read a 10-page paper on the deline delineated subjects to comment on someone else's endeavor to do the same and then eventually participate in a Q&A. And since I accepted the invitation and its directions, I am here mostly to comply. <laughs> but also, as a philosopher, I do resist being objectified as a part of someone else's artwork when I am presenting a philosophy paper in the same way I would do at a philosophy conference, that is, with a presumption that there is no meta level above the presentation itself. Philosophy is an art, but I cannot fully accept my philosophical work becoming part of someone else's work of art. I will therefore break out of this objectifying frame twice. Once immediately following, and again at the end, not merely to assert my philosophical autonomy, but more importantly, as points of general criticism. This is what academic philosophers do. We criticize one another's work. My first point of criticism concerns Piper's worldview in Escape to Berlin. My second will be to register an objection against what is being done to me here as a person of color. Between my first and second escape from Adrian Piper's art exhibit, I will discuss racial identity in the ways directed that I agree to comply with. And this is a subject in which I've published over 10 philosophy books, scores of articles, hundreds of presentations during an academic career that began in 1991 after I took a 20-year absence from philosophy and academia when I got my PhD at Columbia University in 1970. Um, I write so much because I live in Eugene, Oregon, and aside from obligations on campus, there's not much else to do there. So I go home <laughs> and write. But the problems presented in the artworks presented here for comment are new, and I welcome that. And now for the first point of my criticism. So I begin with Escape to Berlin, which I read as an honest account of Piper's personal reactions to her long battles with professional academics and administrators before she moved from the United States to Germany in 2006. Piper's memoir is a dialectic between two poles, her ideal family of origin and her very problematic work families extending from graduate school to a 15-year stint at an institution, which I will follow her in not naming, although it is easy enough, it is easy enough to identify from her online CV and its two female secretaries of state alumni. <laughs> she calls this institution the college. Now, most of the memoir in Escape to Berlin 
is about the effects of the behavior of members of the college, specifically her colleagues, but administrators also, on her well-being. She believes that their distinguished alumni may have been instrumental in placing her on a US airline terrorist watch list in 2006. She believes that they sought to kill her, or at least not prevent her death, which could have been predicted by their failure to accommodate or even credit her need for accommodation resulting from several surgeries. Before the memoir begins, Piper presents a theory of human development that I understand as follows. So this is my understanding of Piper's theory of human development. Everyone starts out in a condition of moral purity as a sprout, but the sprout becomes enshrouded with lies and social conventions that distort its ability to develop as who she is, to express herself, or even to resist further enshroudment. Unwinding these resulting spools is very difficult because new enshroudments are constantly accreting. Children all over the world are abused and cannibalized by their parents and other elders as sprouts. They are broken or badly compromised. But there are also real children. And Piper claims to have had the benefits of being such a real child. Her parents and relatives worked hard, said what they meant, kept their word, had good manners, and always dressed impeccably. Her mother, her mother and father truly loved one another, and they raised Adrian within an extended family as an only child. She received unconditional love and was supported in all her projects as self-development and self-expression that is within her family. Now, to me, this reads remarkably like the life of the Buddha. But instead of being appalled by the sight of other suffering, unlike the Buddha, Adrian herself experienced unimaginable, unimaginable suffering, disappointment, frustration, retaliation for resisting, a debilitating liver disease, financial depletion, and thwarted lawsuits over her academic career. During the last 15 years of that career, she was a full professor at the college, but was eventually fired from that tenured position soon before, very soon before she'd be able to actually retire and collect a pension. And it was during the denouement of that final blow that Piper moved the cherished contents of a family home, her archive, and her two cats to Berlin. The Buddha was a prince. He had an inherited authority that allowed him to practice compassion and become an ideal for inner peace in his society. Even when he gave away his material possessions, he still had the power of wealth and high lineage in his society. Piper, by contrast, emerged from her beautiful family without that kind of power. She was a black woman who appeared to be white, which was, and still is, a highly suspect and socially disadvantaged identity in US society. And she had to make her own living. Escape to Berlin unfolds as a dialectic between these two poles, the cherished family and the evil academic institution. The book is interspersed with family photographs and accounts of abuse from the academics, betrayal by individuals, lack of loyalty, lack of support, dishonesty, and so forth. From adolescence, at least, Piper, Piper was an artist. And at the time the college hired her, her production of art was an integral part of her work life, and they agreed to support those endeavors with research funds and reduced teaching obligations. The college, however, did not keep its word, neither about the research funds nor the reduced teaching load. 
Piper exercised her, her academic freedom as well through internal institutional initiatives that supported African American students and faculty on campus. And when Piper complained about the failure to fulfill its obligations for her research funding on an administrative level, as well as within her own department, the college retaliated for the complaints and her on-campus activism by telling her that they did not recognize her artwork as an academic contribution by cutting her salary, canceling her courses, and later on refusing to accommodate her during a two-year convalescence period following surgeries for a liver disease. When she sued them for retaliation, her case was dismissed because the filing exceeded time limitations. Before she was fired as a tenured full professor, Piper regularly drove from the college in the west of Boston to her family home in Cape Cod. It was a very difficult and, a t and at time, it was, exp it was very difficult and at time impossible for her to stay awake at the wheel because she was working three jobs. And during this time, she also cared for her dying mother over a two-year period. As she reports in Escape to Berlin, she became abject to the point of identifying with roadkill. And she wrote in an insert to the book dated 2003, quote, I identify with roadkill, especially after they have been dead for a few days and their mashed and matted corpses with their staring eyes start looking dry and dusty. They are so little. After a while, their fur coats look like bad fake fur. You have to work to remember they were alive once. And what would be alive now? And, and that, would, that they would be alive now if everybody else were not going so fast. I say prayers for roadkill because they were innocent. I always hope dying did not hurt them too much but I think they are lucky because it is over now and they are free." Close quote. This is abject on Piper's part. And here is my first escape from this iteration of her Concepts and Intuitions art exhibit. Piper's suffering at the college was the result of a failure on her part to understand the reality of academic politics and the power of institutions. She is correct that within philosophy, there is mediocrity instead of meritocracy. And she is correct that academic friends and colleagues will not stick their own necks out to support someone who is being treated unjustly. She is correct that people who want to be considered morally good are often hypocrites who practice backstabbing, undermining, and betrayal, followed by abandonment of someone who has helped them in the past and needs their help now. She is correct that racism and sexism are in our broad society ready to be deployed within institutions against individuals deemed troublesome. So first the person is trouble, troublesome and then there will be various racist and sexist reactions. But I do not think that her reaction to the college was correct. I think that as a philosopher, she had the conceptual tools to recognize certain realities that she seems to have ignored. These are the realities. Institutions protect themselves and do not hesitate to crush individuals in that process. People who are behaving badly but remain within the rules and power structures of such institutions are insulated from moral arguments that they change their behavior. Cronyism is the dominant social structure within such institutions. And when the chips are down, if you do not have powerful cronies, you are toast. To put this slightly differently, institutionalized academic life is not for the unreconstructed high status Buddha. It is a state of war, and the principles of warfare survival apply. Choose your battles. 
Do not engage in a fight that you know you will lose. Know when to retreat and then retreat. This is a question of priorities. If it is important to you to keep your job, you will have to accept defeat and recognize it as defeat, not all the time, but on certain occasions. Piper consistently behaved as though she were involved in a moral battle instead of a battle for academic career survival. The, the career and the morality, I believe, are two separate things. I submit that she should have known better. I am not criticizing her for being naive, although she was naive. I am criticizing her for failing to wake up and smell the dog shit earlier on. Earlier on, when the stench was palpable in graduate school, in Escape to Berlin, she relates how she was ignored and marginalized for expressing her own views by her advisor, who happened to have been, and posthumously remains, the most acclaimed academic political philosopher of the 20th century. And I, I think I can, because he's uh, no longer living, I think I can tell you who that is. It's John, it was John Rawls. Or she might have adjusted her behavior at her first job when colleagues made it clear that they did not welcome her sincere criticisms and questions about their philosophical presentations. Speaking for myself, I am more interested in winning the war than immediate battles, and I have accepted the rules of engagement. Piper says that she has objectified her experience of what has harmed her through her art. That is well and good in terms of art, but in terms of life, expression, and depiction of unjust suffering is an incomplete response to injustice experienced within institutions. It is instead necessary to devise strategies and tactics for survival that neither compromise one's integrity nor, as happened to Piper, sink one into the abject. I believe that Adrian Piper is a first-rate philosopher and that a first-rate academic career was within her reach. I regret her suffering in academia, but I think it would help her and others within earshot or viewing range to understand something about the academic practitioners of certain disciplines, especially philosophy, but others as well. Some people, a minority, choose philosophy because they love it. Others, the majority, choose philosophy because they hate it in what psychologists call reaction formation or what nutritionists identify as addictions to food to which patients are allergic. <laughs> That's why philosophers are so contentious. So yes, it is structurally, it is, it is, uh, in reality, structurally more difficult for a woman and a woman of color. But if you are also a good philosopher or a real philosopher, your colleagues and professors who hate the discipline or are, or are allergic to it will hate you and attack you at every opportunity. There are, however, three ways to stop them, and it's kind of like real estate, but it's publications, publications, and publications which again is another reason why I write so many books. <laughs> many academic philosophers who hate or who are allergic to philosophy have chronic writer's block. They also hate to write, and procrastination is a constant condition for them. If you love philosophy and have carved out the required time by not engaging in battles you will lose, <laughs> you can maintain your position and avoid retaliation by publishing a lot, widely. I further submit that cis European or American males who love philosophy are also attacked and mercilessly persecuted by their colleagues. But of course, women and non-whites, and non-white women especially, come in for special injuries to their psyches. So I now turn, excuse me. <coughs> So I now turn to my
to the remaining assigned artworks. First, Piper's 1981, self-portrait exaggerating my Negroid features. Ah, there it is. Yes, there are believed to be Negroid facial features. And a black person by genealogy, which is to say family inheritance, who looks white, may be able to present herself as black by exaggerating certain features. But the same can be done by white women who otherwise look white. This is because racial categorization is a social and perceptual system that is projected onto otherwise normal human variation in, in, in morphology, in, in shape, in, in facial features. In her 1988 Cornered, an image of Piper appears on a video screen before rows of empty audience seats. I interpret this piece as expressing a kind of catch-22, there it is, concerning the recognition of a person of color. She may be literally cornered by whites because she is a person of color and the target of suspicion, insult, or violence. Or she may be figuratively cornered if whites ignore her. And of course, this is to assume that the audience is white, but the audience usually is white. In her 1995 self-portrait as a nice white lady, Piper presents how she imagines that white women see her before they learn that she is black. I do not fully understand this because Piper does not look like a nice white lady in that portrait. She, she looks like someone who is withholding judgment with arch self-restraint. I do not understand why a nice white lady, the word nice being, a, being code for white skin privilege and willed ignorance of the existential circumstances of those who are not white, I do not understand why such a person would have any judgment to withhold or even experience any need to restrain herself. Piper's 2012 thwarted project Stashed Hopes, a moment of embarrassment, was meant to express her resignation or withdrawal from racial identity in the US sense. And yet, this exhibition is all about racial identity as is my assigned panel topic. I conclude, from not just from, from that, those realities, but from a broader social reality, I conclude that it is virtually impossible to withdraw from racial identity, not because it is impossible to withdraw from how others view one, but because a life in the United States with the internal knowledge of, for instance, being black, means that racial identity projected onto one and internalized or merely, imbi merely imbibed through the ethers of the social air have become, in Piper's terms, part of the enshroudment of the sprout mentioned earlier. In relation to her 1992 article addressing racial identity, passing for white, passing for black, Piper uses her knowledge of the biological emptiness of racial categories together with her experience of how others have reacted to her racial appearance to conceptualize any racial self-presentation as a form of passing. In her case, I think there is a triple passing. First, having any racial identity at all is a form of passing, given the biological emptiness of race. And second, presenting herself as either black or white since neither exclusive racial identity captures who she is, not even in social racial terms. And third, uh, the third form of passing is having a white racial appearance while being black, which means that she is likely to be passed by others as white. Altogether, what this does for racial identity is that on a conceptual level, it undoes it. But on a lived, sprout-centered level, as noted, it probably does little to unwind the spools or shrouds of racial identity. And now for my second escape from this visit, this exhibit. As I suggested at the outset, not only do I resist being objectified as a philosopher, but as a woman of color, which I am, it feels like a double objectification. 
The objectification is perhaps made more bitter for me by the fact that there are so few non-white panelists overall throughout this exhibit talking about an herb that has such a strong theme of race in an exhibition that has been iterated in two major cities in the United States of America. In the United States at this time, it is very important that people of color be heard talking about race with their own voices based on their own experience. This relates to the importance of both shared and personal history in a racist society, which histories are very different depending on a person's racial identity. In other words, it's not a matter of the optics, it's a matter of the previous life history that has brought someone to that point. It may be that Piper was unaware of my racial identity, even though I think it's well known among those in the United States who are now philosophers of race that I identify as mixed race. It may be, uh, I, that's probably not the case. It, she probably did know. It may be that she anticipated all white panelists, or mostly white panelists, and just liked the idea of doing to white Europeans and Americans what they have and still do to people of color, namely fail to fully recognize their human dignity and treat them like animals or things that can be objectified, treat them like objects. In that case, I may be like the dolphin who got caught in a tuna net. But even for tunas, I think it's morally wrong to entrap them that way. Like Piper, I have both white and black ancestry. The difference is that her racial mixture extends several generations back in her black family history, whereas my mixed race identity is first generation. And the, this last might be why Piper basically identifies as a black person with a white or nearly white appearance, whereas I identify as a mixed race person with a racially ambiguous appearance. Thus, as a black person, and perhaps even a black person who would consider me black also, I don't think it's just for Piper to have put me in this position. I think that for her, although not for relevant authorities in the institutions of the art world, race is not her primary theme, as Escape to Berlin makes clear. Her primary theme is that academics are often unjust. However, Racial identities remain salient for Americans who cannot escape being racialized within the United States. This is perhaps a political issue. And what my criticisms may point to is a lack of political awareness on Piper's part. And, and to be fair, some, quite a few philosophers, for instance, Plato and Aristotle, although probably not Kant, would say that a lack of political awareness is a virtue. As I said at the outset, this is interesting. And I'm being paid for a delineated performance that except on its meta level is very like a normal performance for me. So finally, despite the critical and resistant aspects of this paper, which I hope can be accepted as part of the craft of philosophy, let me close by saying that I have tremendous admiration for Adrian Piper. She has lived a life with integrity based on a tripod of philosophy, art, and yoga. And not only is that not easy to do, but she has done it well and excelled with rationality in the structure of the self, a two-volume study in Kantian metaethics, her philosophy book that took 34 years to write, top international honors with the 2015 Venice Biennial Gold Lions Award, and steadfast adherence to the very good values she learned from her very good parents. Moreover, this exhibit, its predecessor at MoMA, and its successors in Europe are a magnificent achievement and culmination for Piper and the international art world. And I am honored to have had this small part in the overall work. Thank you.
Thank you all for being here. Thanks also to Claudia, Janini, and Allison for inviting me, and to Naomi and Diarmud for the conversation. So I'll admit I was a bit saddened to learn that Zach accepted her invitation to the Hammer Museum with some reluctance, since being asked to participate in this panel has made her feel objectified. I imagine Piper may also be saddened to learn it, since her own work testifies to the painful experience of being objectified in various ways. I admit also that I'm not sure I entirely understand just why Zach feels the way she does, so in part I am asking her to elaborate if she is willing. Zach first says that she resists being video recorded as part of an art exhibit and being objectified as part of someone else's artwork. And yet, it's my understanding that it was the Hammer Museum itself, not Adrian Piper, that requested our consent to be video recorded. And it's also my understanding that were Piper to want to use the panel video recording as part of her artwork, she would need to receive our permission to do so. Yet I haven't received any requests from Piper indicating that she wishes to use our panel in any future artwork. And moreover, it was my impression that had I or any other panelist indicated our discomfort with being video recorded, the panel would have remained unrecorded and for this audience's ears only. In fact, having myself been the target of online shaming last year, I waffled over whether to grant my permission to be videotaped. But again, neither the museum nor Piper gave me the impression that my participation was contingent on the panel being video recorded. But perhaps there is something of which I am unaware. In reading Zach's reply, I can't help but wonder if Piper will experience Zach's critique as yet another indication of the lack of support that she says characterized her career in academic philosophy especially since Zach has spent a decent chunk of her career trying to improve the climate for marginalized philosophers, I imagine Piper may also be surprised to learn of Zach's somewhat unsympathetic assessment. I have in mind specifically Zach's remarks that Piper, quote, should have known better, should have been able to wake up and smell the dog shit earlier on when the stench was palpable in graduate school, should have known, that is, that in philosophy, academic friends and colleagues, quoting Zach here, will not stick their own necks out to support someone who's being treated unjustly, end quote. Should have known that so many people in the world of academic philosophy are backstabbing hypocrites. Should have known that institutionalized academic life is a, quote, state of war. And should have known to use her conceptual tools that she developed as a philosopher to recognize such realities. In saying all of this, Zach suggests that Piper's biggest mistake was acting as though she was, quote, involved in a moral battle instead of a battle for academic career survival, end quote. Yet I think a more charitable way of interpreting Piper lies just here. That is, perhaps Piper is best interpreted as critiquing the fact that in order to stay in academic philosophy, she would have had to compromise her morals. Note also that throughout her book, Piper repeatedly invokes the famous philosopher Socrates, a man executed in 399 BC for refusing to compromise his morals. Zach writes that this is all a question of priorities. If you want to keep your job, you have to accept defeat. But I read Piper's writing in Escape to Berlin as an indictment of this very fact. In other words, Piper is saying that academic philosophy is not, in fact, a desirable place to be if its participants have to collude with immorality. In this sense, I would say that Piper's reflections are less naive than critical, critical of just how immoral people in academic philosophy can be, including even those who work in moral philosophy. Indeed, this is maybe one reason Piper invited me to participate on this panel. Um, as I mentioned earlier, last year I was the object of less than kind criticisms and misreadings from fellow academic philosophers, many of whom called me names and attempted to censor my work. Most distressingly, this includes self-identified self feminists and ethicists. 
And at the time, I myself contemplated leaving academic philosophy because I too wondered whether it was a space that in fact lived up to its own professed principles. In the end, however, I received support from an overwhelming number of philosophers, which in part renewed my willingness to remain in the field. Piper's experience in academic philosophy was less positive than not, however, and ultimately drove her out of the field despite an incredibly, amount, incredibly impressive amount of philosophical accomplishments, including, to quote Zach, publications, publications, publications. Zach turns to our panel's explicit topic toward the end of her remarks, where she states that although Piper expresses her attempt to withdraw from her racial identity in the U.S., we shouldn't indulge the idea that it is possible for those still living in the U.S. to do so. In the U.S. context, racial identity is far from a merely subjective affair. It is instead a deeply objective one. In other words, words, one largely defined by social forces beyond one's control. Yet here again, I read Piper's writings in Escape to Berlin as a critique of the ongoing social policing of racial identity in the US. Policing that threatens, in Piper's words, to enshroud the sprout of human development. In other words, Piper is urging Americans to expand their horizons and think more creatively about how to construe racial identification in contrast to how they currently construe it. Zach ends her remarks by sharing that she resists not only being objectified as a philosopher, but as a woman of color, to quote her. And she says that she thinks it unjust for Piper to have put her in this position. I've tried to understand why Zach feels this way, but I acknowledge that our differing positionalities limits my ability to do so. But in part, my ability to understand why Zach feels the way she does depends on her understanding of objectification. Oftentimes, we think someone is objectified if she's used as a tool for another's purposes without her consent. But insofar as Zach's consent was necessary for her participation on this panel, I doubt this is the understanding of objectification that she has in mind. I imagine perhaps she feels objectified more in the sense of fungibility, that is, perhaps she feels treated as if she were interchangeable with others, in this case, other philosophers of color. Zach gestures toward this possibility when she mentions her regret being the only non-white person on this panel and part of the larger um, panel series, while granting that perhaps Piper is unaware of Zach's racial identity. Yet not only do I think it's highly likely that Piper is aware of Zach's racial identity, but more importantly, I think Piper invited Zach because Zach's extensive philosophical work on mixed race identity and how to understand the category of race is extremely relevant to Piper's own work. In this sense, although of course Zach's identity as a woman of color is not distinct from her identity as a philosopher, it is the latter rather than the former that surely motivated Piper to invite her. And if I'm correct to think that Zach's philosophical work is what motivated Piper to invite her to speak, then it seems that Zach has less reason to feel objectified in the sense of interchangeability, as if any philosopher of color could have filled the token slot and done the trick. To be clear, I'm not trying to suggest that Zach should not feel the way that she does. One feels how one feels. But if Zach is willing, I think it would be valuable for the audience, panelists, and certainly Piper herself to hear more in the hopes of gaining a better understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca thinks I agreed to be here with some reluctance. That's not quite true. I resolutely accepted the invitation and having done that, resisted a couple of things. The difference between us is that Rebecca thinks this is a normal philosophy panel, as though there were such a thing, uh, orchestrated by the Hammer Museum. I think that this is a philosophy panel that was conceived by Adrian Piper as an additional, in this case, living installation for her ongoing exhibit. It doesn't really matter whether or not it's been videotaped. 
Um, as for the details of what brings us here, some future historian can go over the various papers and sort this out at some unspecified future time if anyone is still interested at that time. As I indicated, I am not used to doing philosophy as part of an art installation, and I think that in itself is an objectification. An objectification of us as philosophers and an objectification of our demo demographic traits. It is an objectification because someone else has orchestrated our presence and production for or as part of a bigger project. But Rebecca wants to know how I feel. I feel great. Being part of an art installation and resisting it has broadened my imagination. <laughs> it's made me think about other activities in my life as installations, if not exactly art. <laughs> Rebecca talks about racial imagination and how we need more of it. That is true. But my response to what she says about that and here is where it gets complicated. My response to what she says about that is in my response to her paper, which will come later. There's been a suite of papers, responses, and responses to responses, all choreographed by Adrian Piper, and it's very easy to get confused about where one is in any particular segment of the whole, um, the whole suite of papers. So, um, so please stay tuned for my further remarks about this uh, when, about racial imagination uh, when she reads her paper and I respond to that, not to mention her five minutes of response to my response <laughs> as I am now responding to her response to my paper. I am accused of having been charitable, of having not been charitable to Adrian Piper. This question, uh, referring to, paper, to uh, uh, Piper's own writings about a British philosopher, is not really a question of charity, it's a question of understanding. The question is, have I done my best to understand her? I have done my best, but that is not to say that I have succeeded. Okay, these are all the foregoing I see as quibbles. The heart of the matter is the question about morality. What do we do when our coworkers and the company or institution that employs us behaves unethically? What do you do? This is not only about academic philosophy, but it applies to any job and much broader life circumstances. If, for instance, government officials behave unethically. Experience teaches that people who behave unethically cannot always be changed or persuaded by a moral plea or moral argument. Sometimes they can, and in those cases, they apologize and change their behavior. But often, they are immune to moral issues. So what do we, who believe we have morality on our side, do? First, it's necessary to assess the situation. Those behaving immorally, both within and outside of academia, are likely serving other purposes in compliance with rules or laws that have a force of their own. A law can be immoral or unjust and still remain a valid law, and the same holds for institutional rules. Recognizing this fact is not the same thing as compromising one's moral system or personal integrity. It is a purely practical matter. What one can do if moral persuasion is ineffective, is to take practical action. For example, lodge complaints, work within the rules or laws, and fully exercise other rights as possible. For example, in the broad case, by voting. In some cases, one may not win. In other cases, one may decide to put up with the unethical behavior for other practical reasons, but there is no uniform response. It is not possible to win every battle. One waits it out. One rolls with the punches. There is no compromise 
to one's morality in recognizing this. What I did and continue to criticize about Piper's approach to academic life is that she persisted in the futile belief that moral claims alone are sufficient to get the changes one wants. That approach to practical life, both within and without the academy, eventually depletes a person. In Piper's case, it led to her escape to Berlin. But don't get me wrong, I do think that turned out to be a magnificent escape. Thank you. So in thwarted projects dashed hopes, a moment of embarrassment, Piper announces, henceforth my new racial designation will be neither black nor white, nor white but rather 6.25% gray. With this statement, Piper undertakes an attempt towards self-definition in an otherwise rigid system of racial identification. Some social identities have loosened at the seams Others have a way to go. Had Piper announced, henceforth, my new gender designation will be neither male nor female, but gender queer, likely few readers would flinch. However, Piper would not employ the language of gender designation, but that of gender identity, language that denotes the growing consensus that when it comes to your gender, self-identification is of paramount moral importance. Yet race remains tightly circumscribed by others. Piper's experience in the racial in-between, the realm of the non-binary, is a moving indictment of the policing tendencies that accompany rigid social categorization systems. In response to the pernicious effects of our collective tendency to police racial identity, we should follow Piper's lead and creatively challenge our society's restrictive criteria for racial identity. We've witnessed efforts to rigidly police racial identity time and time again in this country. We saw them on display when Susie Phipps was told that her self-designation as white was irrelevant. According to Louisiana law, she was 132nd African and thus legally black. And we saw them on display when former NAACP chapter head Rachel Dolezal underwent a grueling public shaming for claiming a racial self-designation other than that of her biological ancestors. And it is not only identification as a member of a given race that triggers policing tendencies, increasingly identification with members of another race does too. Consider the outrage that ensued over white artist Dana Schutz's painting, Open Casket, which depicted the mutilated body of Emmett Till, the 14-year-old African-American child murdered in 1955. Alongside 30 signatories, biracial artist Hannah Black penned an open letter calling for Schutz's painting to be removed and destroyed. In it, she wrote, quote, the subject matter is not Schutz's, and it is not acceptable for a white person to transmute black suffering into profit and fun, end quote. Or consider the recent uproar over white poet Anders Carlson Wee, who was publicly lambasted for publishing a poem in which a homeless narrator uses African-American vernacular English. In response to his poem, prominent black feminist Roxane Gay enjoined Anders and other white writers to, quote, know your lane. Adrian Piper clearly laments such trends, what she calls an escape to Berlin, quote, the configuration of expectations, sanctions, and conventions that form and fossilize around you, that gradually make spontaneous movement and so growth impossible, end quote. Those with ambiguous racial identities are afforded an albeit painful window onto the remarkable potency of our collective desire to police identity. Identifying as black, but able to pass for white, Piper has received ample opportunity to ponder the source of these policing tendencies, or as she puts it, quote, the unspoken basic values that I must have threatened. 
end quote. Piper has been the target of all manner of people's efforts to police her identity. From, I'm quoting her, upper middle class white schoolmates to working class black neighborhood playmates, end quote. Piper speaks movingly about such individuals and their attempts to categorize her race with their, quote, fixated stares and silent visual inventories, end quote. And she reflects on her professor who critically remarked, Miss Piper, you're about as black as I am, as well as the black working class kids who pulled her hair and called her pale face. In all of these cases, one detects a certain image of blackness replete with its own set of expectations. Such expectations are symptomatic of the generalizations and stereotypes that tend to accompany all racial thinking. To be sure, these generalizations and stereotypes are not limited to black people alone. Indeed, in her piece, Self-Portrait as a Nice White Lady, Piper depicts the stereotype of white womanhood, non-confrontational, submissive, and accommodating. On the other hand, in her piece, Self-Portrait Exaggerating My Negroid Features, one detects a more hardened depiction of femininity, one closer to the trope of the angry black woman. One piece captures what her university expected Piper to be, as she writes in Escape to Ber Berlin, namely, quote, another nice white lady just like themselves, end quote. And the other speaks to the betrayal that the university felt upon discovering she was, quote, exactly what they were least able to stomach, a difficult black woman more difficult than most, end quote. What drives our passionate attachment to such rigid identity scripts, particularly in the realm of race? Other categories like class and gender have undergone progressive detachment from determinist narratives. Indeed, it was not long ago in Britain that class status was tightly tied to birth. If you were low-born, you stayed low-born, and if you were well-born, you stayed well-born. Nowadays, as the recent royal wedding attests, anyone can, in principle, achieve high-class status. Similarly, although birth sex was long believed to circumscribe the gender identity that one can properly claim, the movement for transgender rights has helped foreground the moral primacy of self-identification versus birth sex. Alongside the progressive decoupling of birth status from class and gender identity, we bear witness also to greater variation in the behavioral expectations placed upon those who identify as, say, women, men, wealthy, poor. You can identify as a woman who rejects norms of femininity. You can be a member of the upper class and marry someone from a lower class, etc. This is not to suggest, of course, that social norms and expectations exercise no force in the realms of gender and class, but rather that their influence is far less powerful than it once was. In the case of race, however, birth continues to exercise a stubborn influence. One's racial identity is tied to one's birth race, end of story. If you're born white, you're white, and if you're born black, you're black. Yet what does it mean to be born white or black in America? The non-binary cases plainly reveal the racist rules that continue to, to inform the American race concept. These rules dictate the ongoing legacy of the one drop criterion of black racial membership, the idea that one black ancestor makes one black. This legacy is seen in the media treatment of President Barack Obama, repeatedly referred to as black despite the fact that he is actually mixed. Although Obama's mother was white and his father black, in this country, he could not identify as white. According to the rules, black ancestry automatically makes one black, but white ancestry does not automatically make one white. And why not? Because the one drop rule of black racial membership treats blackness as a contaminant. On this view, one drop of white blood means nothing, while one drop of black blood means everything. It would appear then to quote Baz Dreisinger, that the slightest tinge of black blood has potent transformative powers, end quote. In her exhibition, Cornered, Piper powerfully reminds us that according to the still predominant one drop rule, very many people who claim to be white in fact turn out to be black. She challenges white viewers to consider the likelihood that they too are black and to sit with the discomfort that arises as they reckon with this possibility. She invites viewers also to interrogate their assumptions about Piper's motives for declaring she is black. 
For instance, assumptions that she's doing so for affirmative action reasons or to otherwise, quote, gain the institutionalized rewards of being black, end quote. Rachel Dolezal has similarly remarked, quote, people presumed I identified as black to advance my career or make more money and the press seemed happy to play along, end quote. Few cared to consider that Dolezal devoted her life to black activism, taught Africana studies courses at the local university, organized Black Lives Matter protests, hosted a weekly video series to raise awareness about black issues, and engaged in protests of police shootings. Few stopped to consider how downright strange it would be for someone to identify as black for over 10 years simply to get ahead, whatever that means given the very real costs of black identification in the US. People did care to highlight the fact that Dolezal was the head of her local NAACP chapter, since this conveniently fits their narrative that she identified as black for personal gain or institutional reward, yet they didn't care to mention that hers was an unpaid volunteer position. In short, the collective imagination seems hard pressed to understand why anyone would want to identify as black if not for ulterior motives. And yet, is it not insulting to assume that someone who can pass for white would only identify as black for institutional reward? Does such an assumption not, in Piper's words in Cornered, quote, bespeak an inability to imagine or recognize the value of being black, end quote. Indeed, for those who were paying attention, the public reaction to Dolezal revealed a similarly disconcerting message, for far too few were willing even to entertain the idea that her identity could have been based on a recognition of the value of being black. If anything is clear, it's that we are remarkably confused in this country about race and racial identity. While there may appear to be hard and fast rules according to which race thinking operates in the US, the matter is in fact far more complicated. Indeed, empirical studies reveal that everyday Americans hold quite divergent and contradictory views on race. For example, while many people believe race is most certainly tied to ancestry, others think that race and ancestry can come apart, while some think that race is inextricably tied to physical appearance, and yet others still deny this. What can we learn from this? One thing we can conclude is that we will be sorely disappointed if we try to settle the fact of the matter about race by appealing to everyday racial discourse. If this discourse is as contradictory and inconsistent as the data suggests, then we'll have to turn elsewhere to decide how best to understand race. In other words, instead of asking how we do understand race in America, we can start asking how we should. So what then should it take to claim one's identity as a member of a given or multiple races? Let's consider a few possibilities. Many will offer an immediate answer, family history. On this view, your racial identity is inextricably tied to the race of your family members, end of story. Yet which concept of family are we using here? Indeed, consider that Rachel Dolezal's ongoing familial connections are far blacker than white. She has black identified children and four black adoptive siblings she largely raised herself, one of whom she adopted as her own. She's long been estranged from white parents, her white parents, and instead identifies a black man as her father. If race is in fact a biological fiction, then why insist on the relevance only of her biological family with whom she strongly disidentifies? After all, family is not always biological. Some people are adopted and some people create future families with a radically different racial makeup from the one of their biological family. Still others prioritize not merely genealogy, but physical appearance. After all, one's physical appearance most often subjects one to racial discrimination. Yet physical appearance is also a poor criterion for racial membership. Indeed, if we are truly looking hard at racial identity to hearken back to our panel's title, we see that wide phenotypic variation exists among members of all races. If appearance becomes the relevant criterion for racial membership, many people would be forced to change theirs. Of course, none of this is to deny the many pernicious effects of colorism or the tendency to favor light over dark skin shades. However, colorism alone cannot determine racial membership, for if it did, dark-skinned Indians and blacks would become members of the same race. 
and that would stretch the race concept well beyond recognition. Perhaps then it is not appearance that matters, Another potential criterion sometimes invoked is what Piper calls the suffering test of blackness. The suffering test maintains you're black if you're identified as black, quote, either visually or cognitively by a white racist society, and if you've endured the oppressive effects of that identification. Piper attests to her own encounter with those who demanded that she pass the suffering test of blackness as a condition for her acceptance into the black race. But what evidence is needed to pass the suffering test? Is, for instance, Rachel Dolezal's poverty or experience being treated as a light-skinned black woman irrelevant? If so, why? And Piper further notes in her art exhibit Cornered, quote, if we're going to distribute justice and moral rectitude on the basis of suffering, then happy idiots and successful Uncle Toms wouldn't get any anyway, no matter how visibly black they are, right? End quote. Moreover, the suffering test understanding of blackness reveals an attachment to identity framed as injury. On this view, black identity is a sad identity, one inextricably tied to suffering, marginalization, and subordination. Yet in framing black identity exclusively in these wounded terms, do we not preclude more emancipatory ways of understanding it? As the feminist Wendy Brown explains, quote, in its emergence as a protest against marginalization or subordination, Politicized identity thus becomes attached to its own exclusion. It makes claims for itself only by entrenching its pain in politics. It can hold out no future for itself or others that triumphs over this pain." End quote. We are still searching as a society for how best to circumscribe racial identity. Yet while the negotiation over racial membership takes place, we simultaneously walk a fine line between recognizing and perpetuating our racial and cultural divides. From fashion to literature to food to art, people are increasingly forewarned, do not cross. That is, we are being told that proper respect means not identifying as or with a culture or race to which you don't already belong. Worse yet, those who violate the do not cross injunction become the target of social shaming, whether it's the white American girl who wore a traditional Chinese dress to prom, or even black Americans who don African tribal clothing. More subtle forms of shaming are also apparent, such as when whites who participate in black culture are called wiggers. The predictable response to the do not cross injunction is that more and more people won't cross. Instead, we will claim to respect our divides by enforcing them, all in the name of social justice. But what is the likely outcome here, really? Piper compellingly argues nothing other than further separation. Consider her remarks on the all-black art exhibition in Escape to Berlin. She writes, quote, the very idea of staging racially segregated exhibitions in order to combat the legacy of racial segregation suggests confusion. By repeatedly restaging these segregated exhibitions en masse at each of these historical junctures, the mainstream American art world, joined by the African American art professionals whose livelihoods depend on them, prevent racial integration from occurring." End quote. Although racial identities are profoundly important to people, we must interrogate the tendency to reify a static understanding of identity that would bind us in what Piper calls an imprisoning embrace. Put otherwise, we must be wary of the tendency for social identities to go imperial, to quote the philosopher of race, Anthony Appia. As Appia writes, quote, what demanding respect for people as blacks or as gays requires is that there be some scripts that go with being an African American or having same sex desires. There will be proper ways of being black and gay. There will be expectations to be met. Demands will be made. It is at this point that someone who takes autonomy seriously will want to ask whether we have not replaced one kind of tyranny with another." End quote. Paper bravely illustrates what it means 
to autonomously claim one's racial identity in the face of otherwise tyrannical efforts to constrict it. Thank you. You can see that being a philosopher is not a sedentary life. <laughs> what, what, what Piper meant in saying her new racial designation would be neither black nor white, but rather 6.25% gray, is unclear. Also, I can't find textual support for Tuval's interpretation of Piper's account of the social construct of race as preventing her or anyone else from changing their race. Rather, Piper's work throughout, and especially in the passing article, seems intended to challenge how black identities are constructed. That is, there is no evidence that Piper herself has tried to pass for white, much less change to white. Rather, she has resisted others passing her for white solely because she looks white. Also, I don't think that Piper has anywhere advocated for the free choice of racial identities that would involve crossing or passing. Indeed, she writes with regret about those members of her extended family who have chosen to be white and tries to understand their motivations. And I'm now going to quote her at some length uh, on this issue, so please bear with me. Although both of my Piper, although both of my parents had watched many of their relatives disappear permanently into the white community, passing for white was unthinkable within the branches of my father's and mother's families to which I belong. That would have been a really authentically shameful thing to do. Trying to forgive and understand those of my relatives who have chosen to pass for white has been one of the most difficult ethical challenges of my life, and I don't consider myself to have made very much progress. Once you realize what is denied you as an African American simply because of your race, your sense of the unfairness of it may be so overwhelming that you may simply be incapable of accepting it. And if you are not inclined toward any form of overt political advocacy, passing in order to get the benefits you know you deserve may seem the only way to defy the system. In the African American community, we do not out people who are passing as white in the European American community. Publicly to expose the African ancestry of someone who claims to have none is not done. For one thing, there is the vicarious enjoyment of watching one of our own infiltrate and achieve in a context largely defined by institutionalized attempts to, to exclude blacks from it. Then there is the question of self-respect. If someone wants to exit the African-American community, there are few blacks who would consider it worth their while to prevent her. And then there is the possibility of retaliation, not merely the loss of credibility consequent on the denials by a putatively white person who, in virtue of his racial status, automatically has greater credibility than the black person who calls it into question, but perhaps more deliberate attempts to discredit or undermine the messenger of misfortune. There is also the instinctive impulse to protect the well-being of a fellow traveler embarked on a particularly dangerous and risky course. And finally, the most salient consideration for me in thinking about those many members of my own family who have chosen to pass for white, a person who seeks personal and social advantage and acceptance within the white community so much that she is willing to repudiate her family, her past, her history, and her personal connections within the African American community in order to get them, is someone who is already in so much pain that it is just not possible to do something that you know is going to cause her any more." Close quote from Piper. So clearly, Piper does not advocate free choice in racial identity, as Tuval reads her, and neither does she support ongoing rigidities and stereotyping concerning black racial identity. Her themes and theses center on the injustice of how whites interpret black racial identities. It might be nice 
if people could freely and creatively choose their racial identities without blame. But I don't think the process can be as easy as Tuval's comparison to chosen changes in class and gender make it seem. To begin with, changes in class and gender often require years of hard work and struggle. They are more momentous than changes in hair color, as Tubal seems to suggest. While in principle, anyone can make such changes, in reality, everyone cannot make such changes because the small numbers who do change are opposing and resisting stable systems and hierarchies, so they have to have the stability in order to make changes within it. I agree with Tubal in principle that people ought to be able to choose their race without blame. But this principle floats over present reality and histories that make it seem not completely serious. In present reality, individual racial identities are based on intergenerational family racial identities. And the same holds for class identities, although they may not go back as far intergenerationally. Gender identities pertain to individuals alone. There may be family and community norms for how one enacts a gender identity assigned at birth, but the gender identity itself is restricted to that individual, and the individual can change it without denying their family relations, provided that the relatives accept the change. The idea of changing one's race, as designated by birth, has so far fallen under the concept of passing, not changing. And passing is altogether about whether the passer will be accepted as a member of the race they intend to pass into. Historically, the US focus has been on black people, and this is evident in, in uh, Piper's writings that I just quoted. The US focus has been on black people passing for white, a somewhat hush-hush subject as uh, Piper's quotation implies, and with attendant dangers, including violence in the first half of the 20th century. At this time, it seems as though many, perhaps most white people, most, uh, many but not all, are not concerned about some white people who look and live white having small amounts of black ancestry. But the situation is very different concerning white people now passing for black. Tuval provides several recent examples of the vilification of white people who have attempted to pass for black. And Tuval herself has been vilified for an article on transraciality, which is freedom of choice of race, published in 2017 in Hypatia, the leading feminist journal in academic philosophy. How are we to understand the suspicion about motives and shame piled on white people who pass for black or their non-acceptance as black by people who identify as black based on birth designation. Broadly speaking, I think that blackness, while not a sad identity, does have an ongoing history of disadvantage and vulnerability, as well as ongoing struggle for dignity and equality. Those Americans involved in that struggle may feel that they own their part, or generally all, of the struggle, given its history going back to slavery. It is their struggle and their identity by what can be viewed as a birthright, which they do not want to share with members of the group they are struggling against. And neither do they want that birthright ownership simply taken from their group. Of course, this stance and attitude precludes reconciliation. But it could be claimed that real steps toward reconciliation need to come from the more advantaged group. A white person who passes for black does not change the ongoing black struggle. And this may be part of the answer. Another part is that because being black is a socially disadvantaged identity, a white person who takes up that identity for herself even though she has lived among and as a black person remains within the construction of race, a white person. There is therefore distrust of the motives, as Tuval indicated, of motives of a white person who chooses to be accepted as black. It may be assumed that people pass to better their lives in some way. 
We know that it's been the history of black people who passed for white. So from a black perspective, it may be assumed that the white person passing as black must be doing so for some personal gain. This perspective may be unduly rigid and it may also be self-defeating if racial integration is a goal, but it is intelligible and understandable and I submit worthy of respect. Racial identities are not mere varieties, but ranked positions in a social hierarchy with a history that is still unresolved. There is no independent biological foundation for racial differences. Race is a social construct on all levels, but it has a history in society that is now an integral part of racial identity. And this means that real freedom will only occur when liberatory and creative projects are well grounded in that history. Thank you. Thanks, Naomi. So when Piper states that her new racial designation will be neither black nor white, but rather 6.25% gray, I read her as poking fun at the absurdity of America's racial rules. Poking fun, that is, at a racial system that continuously refuses to acknowledge gray areas. Gray understood here not merely in the sense of in between black and white, but gray in the sense of vaguely defined or not fitting in. And I read Piper as lamenting America, Americans' ongoing tendency to box each other into rigid categories, whether by way of social sanction or institutionalized control, which is why she enjoins us, I think, to, quote, celebrate her exciting new adventure in pointless administrative precision and futile institutional control, to quote her. So when she says such things, I interpret Piper as urging us toward a more permissive space for racial identification. Indeed, Piper is rightly troubled by the social tendency to restrict people's freedom in a variety of ways. And in her recent book, Escape to Berlin, Piper asks, quote, why can you not simply reject or discard a new layer of wrapping as though it were a new coat once you decide that another extra layer of armor and the protective padding it offers are not worth the constriction of mobility, the suffocation of breath, and impulse they exact, because your mobility, breath, and impulse have already been so constricted by earlier layers of wrapping, those previous layers that doubled as protection and nourishment on the one hand and restrictive social sanctions on the other, end quote. And remarking on her new life in Berlin, Piper writes, quote, thanks to the continental European convention of coding individuals by nationality, I almost never think about race anymore, an unexpected benefit of having failed to satisfy the requirements of either in America's cartoon dichotomy, end quote. In her reply, Zach takes issue with my interpretation of Piper. Zach reads me as suggesting that Piper advocates for people's right to, quote, freely choose their racial identities, as she puts it. Zach also here mentions my own work on racial transition and what she interprets as my defense of the supposed right to freely choose one's racial identity. However, I do not, in fact, advocate for the free choice in racial identity, nor do, in, do I in my remarks attribute such a claim to Piper. In fact, I think there are important moral limits that ought to circumscribe racial identification and that one's reasons for identification are crucial. I imagine that Piper would agree. As Zach suggests, motives do matter. And yet my point is that we must take care not to automatically assume nefarious motives on behalf of those who disidentify with their birth assigned race. Moreover, my own view is not to deny, as Zach implies, that individual racial identities are currently based on intergenerational family identities. 
However, I do seek to challenge our society's current approach to race, including and especially the assumption that what matters for racial identities are biological as opposed to non-biological family ties. Finally, although I don't here have the space to explain why I think transracial identity differs from passing, I do think that transracial individuals are making importantly different identity claims from so-called passers. Thank you. How are you doing? It's like a marathon, isn't it? Okay, we're getting to the end. Right. Um, so I just got off a plane from the I, I just got off a plane from the UK yesterday evening, and I woke up at 2 a.m. LA time this morning. So I'm like totally, totally jet lagged. Um, but I'm not going to read a paper. I'm going to try and speak freely. Um, so I hope I won't be incoherent. Uh, we'll see. Okay. So you know what the deal is by now. I'm going to stand up and disagree with everything that you've already heard. Um, <laughs> But I'm also going to slightly move the goalposts. So uh, um, if it's not already apparent, um, the panel is chosen by Adrian Piper. The structure is chosen by Adrian Piper. And I think she's chosen each of the people on the panel for a reason. I don't work in the philosophy of race, but I do work on Adrian Piper, both on her art and her philosophy. So I'm going to try and um, situate the works that have been discussed within the broader terrain of Adrian Piper's art and philosophy, and in so doing, raise a question as to whether, one way of hearing what I'm um, asking is whether race is really her topic. I think something deeper is at stake for Piper, and race is a privileged example of that deeper question. Um, so, but I will top and tail my remarks with, um, <laughs> with doing some due diligence to what I was brought over to do, so I will refer to the other speakers. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so I'll start off by saying something about this debate as to whether we're in an artwork. I just think that's wrong, right? We're not in an artwork. Um, I think if you know Piper's uh, writings, you know that she makes a distinction between art and meta-art. Um, this would count as a kind of meta-art according to Adrian Piper's own taxonomy, uh, a kind of meta-art that takes the form of philosophical criticism. So any use Piper makes of this would be meta meta-philosophical criticism, not art. Um, so I neither think this is art, nor do I, unlike um, uh, Naomi, nor do I think it could become art, unlike uh, Rebecca. So there you go, I've disagreed with everyone already. So I'm doing my job. Um, so the second thing I'll say um, is I'm gonna, I'm gonna refuse to avail myself of the last wordism that my coming last on this panel would seem to invite, right? So um, the way that this worked, us getting to this point, was that there was this uh, <laughs> back and forth of papers, and I couldn't start mine until everyone else has been read, and then no one gets to reply to me, and that just seems unjust, right? So I think minimal decency and fairness requires that I not have the last words. I'm not going to try and adjudicate the debate. I think that'd be patronizing and sort of wrong in all kinds of ways. So I'm just not going to do that. Um, so what I'm going to now move on to trying to persuade you that Adrian Piper's after something um, more foundational than a question about race. Right. Uh, so my title, Miss Piper, you're about as black as I am. Um, this title comes from a remark. I don't know, I don't understand the coyness about identifying who says what, so I'm just gonna be really blunt and say all the proper names, right? So this, this paper, or this, um, this title, this remark, comes from uh, an event that Piper records without um, mentioning proper names, possibly because of people still being alive at the time, in Passing for White, Passing for Black. Um, it was, it's basically Willard Quine, who is one of the most eminent philosophers of the 20th century, a logician and a naturalist philosopher, um, comes up to Piper at the graduate reception of the 1974 intake at Harvard and says without preamble or introduction, Miss Piper, you're about as black as I am. Um, this is how Piper records it made her feel. So I felt numb 
and then shocked and terrified, disoriented as though I'd been awakened from a sweet dream of unconditional support and approval and plunged into a nightmare of jeering contempt. Later, those feelings turned into wrenching grief and anger that one of my intellectual heroes had sullied himself in my presence and destroyed my illusion that these privileged surroundings were benevolent and safe, then guilt and remorse at having provided him the occasion for doing so. Okay, so I think a lot of Piper's work, her artwork, speaks to the, the kind of issues that this remark um, expresses. In particular, they speak to what Adrian Piper later in the same article, Passing for White, Passing for Black, calls an essential, this is a quote, an essentializing stereotype into which all blacks must fit, but which mo no blacks, particularly no African-American blacks, do fit. And what I want to get at is what's the deeper significance of stereotypes for Piper, right? So there are racial stereotypes, but racial stereotypes are a kind of stereotype. Um, what I'm going to suggest is that they, um, they speak to a um, conceptually lazy form of categorization in the service of preserving one's own self-esteem. So actually, when one stereotypes someone else, what one's largely doing is protecting oneself. Um, mistakenly, but that's what one's doing. Um, so one way of understanding Piper's philosophical project is that she's interested in our all too human, i.e. something we all necessarily do, black and white, male and female, are all too human recourse to pseudo-rationality. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, so on this way of understanding Piper, particularly her philosophical work, racial stereotyping comes out as a privileged instance, but only an instance of this more foundational phenomenon. Okay, that's to get ahead of myself. All right, so in uh, Passing for White and the artwork Cornered, um, Piper focuses on a kind of cognitive dissonance that she records her self-identification as black whilst appearing as white to induce in others. So the focus in Piper is often, both in the artwork and in the philosophy, in what her, her sheer presence does to other people, the combination of appearing white whilst claiming to be black. Um, so she's interested in this cognitive dissonance that that combination presents for others. It's not a problem for her, but it seems to be a problem for others. And in Passing for White, Passing for Black, Piper talks about, quote, the strange grinding of gears um, that these moments seem to elicit. And she writes, they had a peculiar cognitive feel to them, as though the individuals involved felt driven to make special efforts to situate me in their conceptual mapping of the world. And I think that's what's really at stake for Piper, is this conceptual mapping of the world, and our race, racial categories express something about that. So that's Passing for White, Passing for Black, and that was written in 1992. Um, Escape to Berlin was written up to and including 2017, so it's 25 years later, and she's still... Um, documenting the provocation that this combination of her self-identification as black and her presentation as white um, creates for colleagues. So a lot of this book, um, that's not right. So a lot of this book um, is about, as you've heard, um, is about the her troubles in academia. Um, and I, I'm not in a position to judge Piper's side of that, um, of that uh, set of events, so I'm not going to try and judge it. Um, so one way of understanding um, Piper's attention to race as a visual pathology in works such as this um, is to see her as trying to respond to the... Um, the difficulty that her, as she calls the WASP colleagues, had with this self-identification. So one way of responding is to, in effect, ask in a series of artworks, is this what you see? Right? So self-portrait exaggerating my Negroid features is one way of doing that. Um, 
what you looking at, Mofo? Note the note the speech bubble. No one's commented on that. I mean, it doesn't strike me that this is anything like a self-portrait as a nice white lady. I mean, this like this is someone who is uh, pointedly staring back. The speech bubble, according to Piper herself. Right? I mean, so in case you hadn't realised, I'm not American, right? So. Uh, so the, the vernacular here escaped me, and I actually just didn't want to make a mistake, so I asked Adrian, and she said, yeah, that's, uh, I'm not going to try and do the accent, it will sound ridiculous, right? But that's, according to Piper, working class, black vernacular for what you looking at, motherfucker, right? So the thought would be, you thought you were getting a nice white lady, you're actually getting a really angry black woman, right? So it doesn't look to me like this is um, a portrait of someone as Rebecca describes it, as non-confrontational, non submissive, and accommodating. Uh, I, I don't think that. Um, OK, so what is Piper doing in these works? So one way you can understand what Piper is doing as, is as, um, as sort of presenting a self-defensive, racist fantasy back to the viewer, right? So in this work, we, the viewer, are made to go proxy for the kind of um, what, what Piper calls in um, Escape to Berlin fixated staring that she encounters when people learn of her self-identification as black, right? So she says there's this moment of this uh, strange grinding of gears, people stare at her fixatedly trying to see whether she's really black. Um, and one, one, um, one way of understanding what she's doing is, is kind of giving you, you the viewer, back your self-protective race of fantasy. But what I haven't said yet, uh, what I haven't given you any reason to believe is that this is self-protection. Um, so in order to um, try and make a claim for that, I'm now going to advert to Piper's philosophical work rather more than anyone has done so far. Um, so here's what... Piper says about those kind of moments. Whenever I noticed that fixated stare, that silent visual inventory of the physical features that were supposed to broadcast my racial identity but did not, I would try to imagine the expectations and beliefs and presuppositions I must have been violating, the unspoken basic values I must have threatened, but I never succeeded. Right. So in this strategy of giving you back giving back a imagined viewer back their racist fantasy. These works pick up a long history in Piper's work. So, that, I mean, there's something artificial about the four works we're focusing on because they're situated in a much broader oeuvre, but those are the four works we've been asked to focus on. But you can see these strategies, particularly strategies of um, mimicry, um, have a long tradition in Piper's work, going back to the mythic being. So, this one from the series, I embody everything you most hate and fear. And my personal favorite, cruising white woman, white women. Um, I, I actually think the humor in Piper's work is almost always miss, missed entirely. I think a lot of it is really quite bitingly funny. Um, so there she is, cross-dressing as a hip young black dude, sitting on the streets of um, Boston, like checking out the white women. So now I'm going to talk about Piper's philosophy, briefly. Uh, the, <laughs> the book that I'm talking about is two volumes of about 450 pages each, which Piper published on her own website because Cambridge University Press, having accepted it for publication, then demanded for marketing purposes that she cut 100, words from each, 100 pages from each volume. And if you know Piper, you know that she's going to turn that down, right? So um, I'm just going to talk about the second volume, um, the vol it's, it's freely available on her website. It's called Rationality and the Structure of the Self, Volume 2. And what I want to do is try... Let's just go forward for a minute. Oh, the, okay, so this isn't actually my new PowerPoint. This is my old PowerPoint. I, I was expecting a slide there that isn't there. Okay, so I'm going to try and explain um, four key concepts in Piper's philosophy. The concepts are... Theoretical anomaly, conceptual anomaly, conceptual scheme, 
and pseudo-rationality. And I think if you have a, a grip on those four terms, then you have a way of situating her work in um, Piper's broader philosophy. All right, so the theoretical anomaly. So Piper understands theoretical anomaly as a way of um, coping, a coping strategy, when the evidence, the empirical evidence of what one's presented with doesn't correspond to one's prior assumptions and expectations. So you can understand uh, Willard Quine's remark, Miss Piper, you're about as black as I am, as an example of theoretical anomaly. There just is no place in Quine's conceptual scheme for a woman who appears white but self-identifies black, right? So the response is to deny the evidence, right? That's a form of pseudo-rationality. It's to deny what's in front of your eyes for the sake of preserving your, your prior beliefs, um, irrespective of how um, much the evidence suggests your prior beliefs are wrong. And you can keep on doing that until such time as the cognitive costs of doing so begin to outweigh the gains, right? Until such point as you find it hard to navigate the world, essentially. So this is a spectrum of, as it were, uh, irrational behavior, which goes from like everyday rationalizations. We all make them every day. You know, you can't get through the day without at least one rationalization. That's just human nature through denial to sort of outright dissociation and psychosis at the very extreme. Um, so there are benign and less benign forms of this. Um, so you could, you've got in principle two options when presented with evidence that doesn't correspond to your expectations or, or assumptions about how the world is. One is you deny the evidence in order to preserve your beliefs. The other is that you revise your beliefs in order to accommodate the evidence. Um, now, why would you be inclined to deny the evidence in order to preserve your beliefs? So Piper's view is that um, when a theoretical anomaly, which is to say a person who behaves or looks in a way that your conceptual scheme has no room for, um, falsifies some beliefs, the reason why you don't modify your beliefs in the light of the evidence is the beliefs are actually propping up your own honorific stereotypes through which you understand yourself. So the cost of modifying your beliefs is to modify your view about yourself, and that's painful to people. Um, so the thought is that theoretical anomalies, people who look or behave differently than we, we expect they should, um, threaten our more or less partial, more or less distorted conception of what a human being is. The conception that undermines our own self, that underwrites our own self-esteem. Um, and that would apply in either direction, right? In any kind of stereotyping, any kind of, uh, from, from whichever quarter. But because doing so necessarily, I mean, it constitutively involves falsehood, that falsehood does damage to the rational, rational integrity of oneself. And in order to show that, I now need to say something about um, this second notion I said I wanted to illuminate, which is conceptual anomaly. So I've told you about what theoretical anomaly is, and now I want to say that theoretical anomaly is itself an instance of a broader category of anomaly Piper calls conceptual anomaly. So conceptual anomaly is not, um, so theoretical anomaly is one kind of conceptual anomaly, so they're not different in kind, it's just a special case of it. Um, and conceptual anomaly would be any event, person, or entity that, ooh, is a, am, I, am I getting a, a new PowerPoint? Okay, cool. Right. There's backroom <laughs> maneuvers going on. Um, so, so that would be any uh, event, person, or entity that puts pressure on the very intelligibility of one's conceptual scheme. So I need to tell you what a conceptual scheme is. Right. So the thought is this. It's actually fairly straightforward. The thought is that at any given time, each one of us is explicitly committed to certain beliefs, and in virtue of being in explicitly committed to those beliefs is implicitly committed to a whole set of other beliefs that those beliefs entail, right? 
So think about this. So if I say my cat is on the mat, you know that you're in a philosophy seminar when someone says something like that, right? If I say my cat is on the mat, I can't simultaneously hold that with I have no cat or there are no mats, right? Those, those claims are horizontally inconsistent. They're all on the same level and one denies the other. But the claims also have to be vertically consistent in the sense that although I'm not currently thinking this, saying that my cat on the mat implicates these other concepts. So for instance, it implicates the concept that there are things like mammals or that the world is not made up of, purely made up of abstract mental entities, right? So I, have to, I can't hold both that my cat is on the mat and that the world consists purely of abstract mental entities, right? Why am I telling you all this? <laughs> Because the thought would be that all that, can, all that um, preserves the rational integrity of your world at any time is the horizontal and vertical consistency of those concepts that are in use or implicated by your beliefs at a given time. Right? That, that means they can change. Right? So concepts and beliefs can enter the set as others are displaced. Your set can get broader or it can get narrower. And which it does will have everything to do with um, you know, the quality of your upbringing, your education, your propensity to travel, your outlook, and so on. So this, there's nothing fixed about this. There's nothing that can't be changed. Um, but that there be a set and that the set be more or less um, consistent is a requirement of coherent experience. So once you've got that in place, you can see why something that, as it were, puts pressure on that set is putting pressure on the coherence of your world, right? Because all the coherence of your world rests on is the consistency of the set. Um, so take something like slavery, right? There's a way to understand slavery in just these terms, right? It's only possible to justify slavery if you, contrary to the evidence, regard the people who are enslaved as less than fully human, right? The moral obscenity of slavery is evident as soon as you stop so regarding them. So what does the advocate of slavery have to do? They have to deny the evidence in order to preserve the beliefs that their own positive conception of themselves depends upon, right? That's pseudo-rationality. We just have the one. Okay, so I didn't get my new one. Doesn't matter. Um, normally, it's much more polished than this. Okay, and the last thing to say about that before I turn back to the art is that um, this is something to which we are, all of us, naturally disposed. We're all naturally disposed to maintain our own positive self-conceptions um, until such time as we simply can't function anymore. Um, so it's, it's a general claim about the nature of human enculturation, that whatever, however we're enculturated, there will be some... Because we're not infinite, we're finite. We have limited understandings and so on. We have all sorts of uh, blind spots. So all of us are subject to this to a greater or lesser degree. I'm going to need my PowerPoint back now. Is it there? No. So now I want to talk about the art in the light of what I've said about the broader philosophy. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So what's the upshot of the sort of things? That, and it, I have to stress that I've just spent 10 minutes basically giving you the content of 450 pages. Yeah. That was super rough and ready, right? I mean, I can't tell you how dense that book is. That's why people aren't reading it. It's really, really hard. Um, okay. So the upshot is that racism and xenophobia, which is what gets talked about when Piper gets talked about in an art context, turn out to be just one form, albeit a particularly virulent form, 
of these more general distortions of empirical enculturation. So they reflect our natural predisposition to protect our honorific self-conceptions until such point as the costs of doing so outweigh the gains. Right? So the thought would then be that art, as a domain, provides in principle a space for putting pressure on our distorted and partial conceptions of self and other. Right? By encountering anomal anomalies in an art context, we're encouraged, essentially, to, um, as it were, expand our conceptual scheme, right? to accommodate things that we don't currently accommodate. So there, um, you might understand the project, in the most general terms, as an attempt, a, a set of spurs, to refine our thinking about both self and other. So in Cornered, uh, which it's a bit unfortunate in its exhibition here, you can't really hear her because of the noise of everything else that's going on in the gallery. If you could really hear her, you'd notice some very particular things about Piper's self-presentation in the work. So Robert Storr has talked about Piper being aggressively well-mannered, and that's a really uh, perceptive um, characterization of the sort of persona she projects in these works. I mean, there's also things about her, <laughs> I mean, it's very Martha Nussbaum for the philosophers in the room. It's like, you know, it's twin set and pearls. Uh, there's a very particular theatrics being played out in how she presents herself, right? So she presents herself like this, and the first line is, I'm black, let's deal with that fact together, right? So maximum cognitive dissonance between a, on a certain set of assumptions about what it is to be black that the evidence falsifies. Right? that it presents as a challenge to someone who holds those assumptions. And then the, the work, of, as I think Rebecca said, invites one um, to think about the fact that according to America's, I understand, this is not my area, according to America's default racial categorization rules, um, if Piper's black, then basically everyone's black or no one is, right? according to the one drop rule. Um, and then whether that constitutes a threat to one's own self-esteem as a viewer will be evident from how one reacts to the provocation. So the work provides that provocation in an attempt to find out whether that's something your conceptual scheme can accommodate. Um, now I want to s suggest, uh, finally, that this, in order to make the claim, that I've just made the claim but haven't demonstrated, which is that this is something that ramifies throughout Piper's work and that the, um, the interest is deeper than but privilegedly exemplified by issues of race. I'm now going to talk about a work that we weren't asked to talk about but where I think these concerns are demonstrated even where it looks like it has nothing to do with race. Um, it's also, you know, it's just me abusing the fact that I'm up here and no one can stop me. It's one of my favourite Piper works. <laughs> So this is a work called Everything Number 10. It's from the series Everything Will Be Taken Away. Um, that's a very broad and diverse series. Um, I don't have time to talk about any of the other works now, but I'll just say that um, each work in the series, with the exception of this work, bears the legend Everything Will Be Taken Away in red caps of the kind that you would have tapped out on an old typewriter ribbon, and it's not mirror reversed in any other work. Right? So in this piece, by contrast, the legend is inscribed in henna on the foreheads of volunteers, mirror reversed, right? so that it scans correctly when the volunteer looks at their reflection in a mirror. I'll show you some examples. So, so my suggestion about this work is twofold. I want to draw attention to two things about what's anomalous about the work in the context of the series. So the first off, the fact that henna is a stain, it stains the skin, is surely relevant to someone who presents race as a visual pathology. Right? Um, notice, and I, I, I actually don't know whether this is the case, but notice in the, uh, the work 
um, thwarted projects, dashed hopes, whatever it's called, a moment of embarrassment, there's a sort of red tinge on Piper's hairline. That suggests that the, what she's applied to her face is henna, which would have taken weeks to fade, if that's true. I haven't actually, I've just been thinking about that today, seeing it projected. I haven't actually asked her whether that's true. So anyway, so it's a stain. It stains the skin. It takes several weeks, up to six weeks, to fade entirely. And it's mirror reversed. That it's mirror reversed suggests that the real target of the work is that person for whom the, the, um, for whom the legend scans legibly when they look at themselves in a mirror, right? For everyone else who, accom who as it were, encounters these people as they go about their day-to-day -day business on the you know, subway, whatever, going to work, they're going to have to stare really hard to work out what it says, right? So if you're unfortunate enough to be wearing this, you're going to find yourself being stared at surreptitiously, fixatedly stared at, in order to work out what it is that the, you, the nutter is wearing on their forehead, right? Um, so, the, so the thought seems... so, And these are two examples of people looking at themselves in the mirror, obviously, where it does scan. Um, Participants are made to keep a diary, and they're made to archive the diary. They're made to look at themselves three times a day in a mirror. And what I want to suggest is what Piper is doing here is either wittingly or unwittingly creating the conditions for these volunteers. I think it's actually a really inhumane work for the volunteers, right? It's con creating the conditions to put them in the psychological state that a lot of her own work is responsive to, right? The state of being someone the sh whose sheer appearance presents a problem to others for reasons that one is not in any control of oneself. So this comes out in the diary entries. Um, I won't have time to show that, but you can find that on MoMA's Facebook page. There's an animation of lots of volunteers. So here's one of the diary entries from the series. This is Joanna. On my way home, I think how it must feel to be different, knowing that everyone sees you in a way they normally don't see me. I feel I need to behave more correctly than normally. I feel that I'm being watched. I also wonder whether I'm going to like to have this feeling constantly for the next few weeks. People are looking at me. I have effectively called attention to myself. My forehead has intruded upon the expected. I am different, no longer unobtrusive. Someone just read me. I just want to hide. This is definitely outside my comfort zone. So you can, you can see the way in which that might be, as it, as it were, creating for these participants exactly the psychological state that Piper's own work um, documents. Okay. Yeah. So you can see the, what looks like the henna stain on the hairline. Okay, so I don't know how to take this work. I find this work highly provocative, confrontational, and possibly really deeply offensive. Um, so insofar as it takes, partakes of blacking up, you might think it's deeply offensive, in fact. Now, an, a response on Piper's behalf is to say, ah, yeah, it parodies blacking up, right? It mimics blacking up. That seems a little bit too easy for me and take some of the sting out of the work. I think it's a really arsy work, right? Um, now, Piper presents this work in Escape to Berlin as her way of dealing with the unwanted advances of an elite institution who wanted to recruit her for it to dignify its widening participation agenda. She doesn't name the institution. You're led to believe it's either Harvard or Oxford or something of that ilk. Um, now, Piper at the college, it's Wellesley, <laughs> right? Uh, Piper at the college had been involved in just those kind of initiatives and had every reason to be suspicious of this as just another exercise in, as it were, blackwashing whiteness, right, and wanted no part of it. Um, so what's the response? The response is to blacken up, if I'm right with henna, in a way that will um, last for some time. And you could see that as being asked, is this how you see me, right? Is this what my, your invitation to me to hold this role suggests this is how you see me? 
That's one possibility. But I think the possibility is mutually, it's not mutually exclusive with the other possibility that Piper is offensively blacking up. So I think that's part of the charge of the work is its moral ambiguity. Um, so I'll just say something about the text. Um, so I think that the, um, the text, which renounces in response to this invitation, being both African American and um, so, what does it say? Um, uh, you know, for my next birthday, I'll be neither black nor white, but what 6.25 percent gray, honoring my African American heritage, my African heritage, and my new nationality designation will be not African American, but rather Anglo German American. Ref ref reflecting my predominantly English and German ancestry, right? Okay, so she renounces both being black and she renounces being African-American. And then the last sentence, please join me in celebrate, celebrating this exciting new adventure in pointless administrative precision and futile institutional control. I think that suggests there's some truth in Rebecca's interpretation um, of the work as a protest against policing racial boundaries uh, in the state. Um, so on that front, at least, I'm with Rebecca. Um, so I said I'd say something about the other speakers, and I'm now going to do it. Um, this is how um, Naomi responds to Rebecca. It's... I agree with Tuval. I'm just going to call you Rebecca since you're there. I agree, I agree with Rebecca in principle that people ought to be able to choose their race without blame. But this principle floats over present reality and history in ways that make it no, may make it not entirely serious. Now, um, I don't know whether Naomi presents that as a criticism of just Rebecca or of Rebecca and Piper, but if it's presented as a criticism of Piper, I think it misses the mark. Here's Piper. The science on the fictitiousness of the concept of race is more than a century old, but to treat it as an article of faith that one is free to reject is to lose touch with reality. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? The two claims are entirely consistent. So Naomi and Piper are in agreement about that. Um, so I will say, though, that I think Rebecca gets Piper entirely right in terms of how she perceives the nature of Piper's struggle with the institutions, that Piper takes it as a moral, um, as a, as a moral test not to succumb to certain things for profess professional reasons. Now, that's consistent with Naomi saying, you know, well, that's just self-defeating, right? But I think that uh, Rebecca is right in how she diagnoses what's at stake. Um, yeah, I have other things to say about, so I don't buy at all, not for a moment, the story in Escape to Berlin about the sprout. I just think it's, I think it's kind of terrible <laughs> and hokey and, um, you know, implausible in all kinds of ways. And I also don't buy the perception of, you know, what it is to have been well-parented that that book presents. I think that might have a lot to do with some of the conflicts Piper has had in her life, right? Um, as she presents it, she's the, you know, the doted on only child of four or five adults who hang on her every word unconditionally, right? What kind of expectations will that sow? Um, but anyway, those are personal differences between me and Piper, qua parents, so I won't say any more about them here, and if I hadn't been so jet-lagged, I wouldn't have even said that. Um, <laughs> damn, and it's on videotape. <laughs> um, okay, so, but what I wanted to say was this, before my got the better of me, um, what I wanted to say is that while I think Rebecca gets Piper right about how she perceives her conflicts in academia as moral ones, I think to answer the question that she poses, which is, if race is an empty biological category, why do we continue to appeal to racial history? It's because that's entirely consistent, as Naomi says, with race continuing to be socially determining here and now and Piper addresses reality here and now. Thank you.
uh, greeting, uh, greetings uh, to the survivors. Um, <laughs> I totally disagree with, with dear, dear uh, am, I, am I saying that correctly? Yeah. Because I, and Piper, as it may be, because I think you've got the cart before the horse. Uh, what, yes, people stereotype. Uh, but what we've seen is that racism is a lot more sophisticated than a simple logical error. So what tends to happen is that uh, people with, with existing goals of racism will choose different forms of argument and different kinds of mistake and, and different ways of thinking. In other words, if they're talking about race and they believe that there is an echo of racism in the audience, they can deliberately use stereotypes and deliberately use bad arguments and deliberately make all kinds of logical mistakes. They're deploying all this. It's kind of like violence. You know, violence um, doesn't determine uh, the uses to which it's put. The, the, the point is that if you have hatred and you have a desire for a certain kind of destructive change, one way to bring that about is, is, is through the use of violence, to shoot somebody. But it's not so much the practice of shooting that, that creates a particular destructive uh, change or, or, or a destructive desire for change. In other words, people take up guns but the, gu the guns are there to be deployed and they take them up very selectively in the same way they take up bad arguments, they take up stereotypes, they're yeah. weapons. Yeah. So it's not a universal human uh, racism. I, I think you, you know, Piper is talking about racial perceptions in the 70s yeah. and this is like 50 years later and it's gotten a lot more insidious and a lot more intense and a lot more uh, sophisticated. And it's far more sophisticated than a, than a universal human logical distortion. So I, I don't want to take up audience time, so I'll just say, is this one? No. Yeah. Um, so I'll just say that, um, so what I'm presenting there is what I understand to be Piper's arguments in volume two of Rationality and Structure of the Self. And I've tried to do it without, and I have, done it without mentioning Kant at all, but it's all grounded in a particular reading of Kant, and the reason why I say that now in responding to Naomi's comment is that Kant has a per perception, to put it really boldly, that you only have a unified world if you have a unified self, that that's a biconditional, that you get one in virtue of getting the other, and Piper's trying to diagnose xenophobia in the light of that picture, right? And uh, so all those things about it being a way of shoring up um, the, the coherence of one's conceptual scheme is Piper's way of doing Kant without a lot of the sort of commitments and the architectonic and just with minimal logical consistency. So it's this kind of thin down Kant. That's Kantism. great. First you uh, give Piper responsibility, but now it's Kant. <laughs> you know, Kant is, the, I'm perfectly prepared to believe it's Kant, but, yeah. but that unified sense yeah. of a perfectly rational conceptual system uh, I think is somewhat outdated by uh, uh, contemporary psychology. People are more complicated. You know, people are right. rational when they choose yeah. to be rational, and people also yeah. allow their emotions to kick in, which can happen much faster and yeah. dictate their behavior. Yeah. So there have been contemporary studies that when, when you uh, mention key words that trigger uh, long-standing emotional responses, you'll get an emotional response before the person has yeah. thought it out. So I, so, I don't see yeah. how this is in, uh, in conflict with anything I'm saying, because what you're giving me there is what Piper would call in rationality and structure of the self, a failure of rationality. So it's entirely consistent with the picture she's giving you. You might just think yeah. that it's unavoidable. Uh, but if rationality only fails in selective oppressive actions, then you have to look at the, uh, at the mechanics of oppression and not, the, and not the failure of rationality. In other words, the, over, the failure of rationality be, is, is a deployment, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's an instrument, okay. rather than an, yeah. over, an overarching determinant. Yeah. Okay, so I'm still not sure whether we, we're disagreeing. We should get cute. Yeah. We do disagree, yeah. but we should yeah. get some questions no, from I, the I audience. Want, I do <laughs> want to say one thing. Having said I'm not going to abuse the audience, I do want to say one thing. So. Um, so my basic point was to say, look, 
um, Piper's always talked about in terms of racism, and rightly so. You can't ignore the fact that that's the thematic content of her work. But looked at in the light of her broader philosophical um, project, you see that racism is an instance. This is consistent with what you're saying. You might say you want to might strengthen the claim and say it's self-consciously deployed, it's a weapon, and so on. But it's still an instance of a broader. Um, failure of rationality of which we're capable. Now, maybe the failure is meant, and that's where we're disagreeing. That you're saying it's strategically employed failure, but it's, I don't think at the really, the most foundational level, um, that's inconsistent with Piper's. Uh, but, uh, you know, let's, let's yeah. see what the audience yeah. is interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, let's hear what the audience is interested in. <laughs> Either it's totally up. You can do whatever you want. You've been sitting here quietly long enough. <laughs> I'll, ma I'll, I'll make it a question. Um, without trying to get into to every fine point, something that sort of f floats over this and separating it from the question of whether we're in an art installation. Uh, I'm interested in what any and all of you think about either positively or negatively, what the particulars of discussing these, these issues, and, and for Piper as well, in the context of philosophy is rather than, say, other humanities, which uh, in my experience often take a somewhat different view of some of these same questions. And, and the reason I'm asking this is partially uh, do you think that the incidents that Piper is describing with Quine and or Rawls uh, does, does some of what generates her work have to do with trying to make what she wants to make happen or do her work in the context of a very constrained Anglo-American analytic philosophy sort of tradition uh, and, and having some, even some fealty and still some, some ties to that tradition. Uh, so that's the general area I'm interested in. Okay, I'll just say something briefly about that. So in Escape to Berlin, she laments repeatedly the fact that philosophers often fail to live up to their Socratic heritage, um, as she puts it. And I think that, you know, philosophy is the favored discipline for her to be asking these questions because philosophers are famous for, you know, challenging our preconceptions, our assumptions, the social status quo, and like Socrates, are often vilified or, in his case, executed for doing so. Um, so I think, you know, she's disappointed that, you know, she's seen so many times in academic philosophy folks who seem to give in to the status quo or the kinds of considerations that philosophers perhaps shouldn't take so seriously, like reputational considerations and things like that, and trying to kind of hold philosophy to a higher um, standard. So, look, I think uh, there is a pretty well-developed field called African-American philosophy, uh, more broadly philosophy of race, um, and and it sort of, it crosses traditions. Some, some are, are uh, co so-called continental philosophers, existentialist phenomenologists. Some draw on a uh, tradition of uh, uh, area studies, you know, post-colonial studies, black arts and letters, and some are analytic philosophers. So the case in the 70s ha has changed. Has it totally revolutionized the field? No, but but it, but there's no reason for philosophers not to um, not to take this up. But you know, are they qualified? Uh, they yeah. I mean, as long as they can see points that they're able to make that other people haven't noticed, why not? You know, what do you, what do you think about that? I mean, do you think it belongs in philosophy? Please wait for the mic real quick. I wasn't meaning to question uh, where it does. I, I think I was interested in uh, that position of the 60s or 70s. Look, I'll, I'll lay my cards on the table. I got my, my philosophy doctorate at UCLA right over here in the 90s. And frankly, uh, I learned anything I know about race and political theory on the street because it wasn't what we, what we did there and it, it was a persistent um, you know, and that's one of the reasons I'm not doing philosophy professionally. 
maybe in 20 years. But the point being, uh, do you have any, do you have anything, am I right that some of the pressures on her work uh, have something to do with, and even that encounter with Quine, right, uh, have something to do with wanting to talk about the things that she wants to talk about in the way she wants to talk about them uh, in a context where some of those developments that you're talking about, African American philosophy and a, a much better developed and feminist philosophy, right, right, were not as respected at that oh, time. They didn't exist uh, right. in the early 70s. And, you know, it, I, I'd like to find some research on that encounter with Quine. I don't know what he meant. It's possible they had just begun uh, affirmative act. You know, that was, it would have been 1974, I think. And that might have been the beginnings of affirmative action. And he might have been concerned about uh, the admission of, you know, to make sure the people being admitted were, were um, uh, uh, legitimate uh, claimants. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not defending Quine. I just would like to know more about the context. But, you know, we have to be careful about not, not talking about today. It's actually in some ways better, but in some ways much worse today than it was in the 70s. So, so you can't really talk, you know, this is really a, a story in history rather than a story in current events, some of the issues Piper raises. I'll just add, just for the context, that the, uh, so I should have said that, so Piper identified as black on her application, so the remark expressed the skepticism about that identification, I and mean, it's hard not to see it as that. Wait, all right, there it is. Hi, so earlier, um, you, Zach, uh, you mentioned that um, a solution for the race, the race issue could be found in politics or in the political world. I know historically there's, there were laws in place that kind of got us into the hole that we're in now, but do you think that voting and, and laws t you that target this issue could be enough to rectify the the, the race, do you think it can be a solvable problem specifically in, through politics? Well, it's a, uh, you know, politics has a longer span. Politics is a small P, not a particular political party. So we had the civil rights movement, which was successful in some legal areas. But uh, what some have called a really good writer to apply here is Arthur Bentley. The process of government, the process of government was, was not complete because you had laws that large numbers of people uh, had no intention of complying with or enforcing. So, the, so, so if you just change a law on the books, it's not gonna change society. But if laws and policies change because a majority of the people ha have representationally voted for their change, you have a much better chance. So I think it's all a work in progress. But one thing I'm very clear about is you know, this uh, a moral moral criticism alone is not going to is is not going to do anything except preach to the choir. It's not going to change the people who need to be changed in order to improve things. It's important because it, your moral sense will tell you what should be done, but but the work only just starts after that moral insight. That that's when the real work of one-on-one -on -one change and political change starts. So do I have confidence in politics? Yeah, I mean, I have confidence in, in an ongoing struggle that involves power, and that's really best done in a peaceful way uh, through political effort. Uh, if not, what do you have? You know, you either have uh, um, incredible frustration or violence, and neither of those are really acceptable. So yeah, we need politics. Hello, you guys did good. I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, first time I hear about Adrian Piper. Um, Naomi, I agree with you wholeheartedly, all your comments and so forth. I've, I'm, I'm biracial myself, I identify as black. Um, I get, you know, this really related to me. I just wanted to comment on that. Uh, yeah, there's a, a, a structure that white folks are not seem to be in tune with. You know, they live in it, 
but they don't seem to uh, acknowledge its existence. That uh, you know, there, there's privileges. I've I've benefited from them, uh, uh, made my way through life up to this point, uh, and uh, Miss Peters, right, Adrian Peters, is just uh, given that experience through her art and her her works, which I haven't read. I just happened to you know, just my first time hearing about her. Anyway, that's all I got to say. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. No, that was good. Is it on? Yeah. Um, I'm not a philosophy person, I'm an art person, but I was really, really struck by you, Naomi, talking about feeling both objectified and, so to speak, exploited in your participation here. And also you concluded by talking about feeling honored and having great respect for Adrian Piper. And I see that as paradoxical and I very much enjoyed that paradox because it's almost as if what you were saying was this situation is a both and situation. This is a situation where as a woman of color and a f eminent um, academic and philosopher, I am being used by the institution and even by this artist. And at the same time, I'm very glad to participate in this thing because it's meaningful that a black woman artist has a show like this and that this room is full of people who are really interested in these questions and that that's totally worthwhile. And so to speak, I resist and I, I not comply, but enthusiastically acknowledge feeling honored or not even feeling, because who cares, but being honored to be part of this thing. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think life is complicated. Sometimes um, you get something that's obviously a benefit, but it's not quite right. So and it might not be quite right morally. So if it's really horrible, then you withdraw from it. But if it's bearable and you balance what you're getting out of it or what it's worth with what you don't like and you feel that, well, it's uh, OK, I'll still do this and see what happens. You know, you have to have an open mind. Um, it's not a bad approach. It's sort of what I was trying to suggest as to, as, as to how academic politics can be negotiated. In other words, most academics, whether they're white people or people of color, they really value the job. The position is very valuable. You, you know, if, if you're successful, you have a job for life. Where, where does that happen, right? They, they can't fire you unless you do something absolutely egregious. Um, and it's comfortable and it's livable and it's creative. But on the other hand, you might experience incredible humiliations and frustrations and you, you, have to, you have to negotiate and balance those things. So I really appreciate your recognition of that uh, paradox, paradox not only being an apparent contradiction, right? Yeah. Could I just maybe ask for some clarification? Because I think I'm still trying to understand your remark about you know, Piper having treated you unjustly in some way by inviting you here. So I fully can accept that you, know, you could both have a sense of being objectified and be honored and all that. I think I was just trying to get clarification on you know, the supposed immorality or injustice. I think I'm, I, I still don't fully understand and perhaps it would be helpful. Okay, so there are two things. Uh, one thing is, you know, as Thomas Aquinas said, philosophy is the queen of the sciences. And we, we're obscure and, and we are uh, modest in our, our influence on the world, but we kind of pride ourselves on being able to have the final overview on things. So for somebody else to kind of pluck you out of that and say, oh no, you're, you're really part of what I'm doing, uh, which is an art project, that feels to me like objectification. Feels to me like objectification. It's not a question of how I feel. I've told you how I feel. I feel great. It's fine. But it feels to me like that's a process of objectification. Now, the thing about race is very disturbing because there are very few. There, I'm the only person of color in all of these panels. What does Adrian Piper have in mind in consenting to do uh, what has turned out to be a national? 
uh, art exhibition on race in the United States and, and, not, and not include, say, at least one of the person who identifies as African American. I don't identify as black. I identify as mixed race. That's my experience. So I'm not claiming a black identity that I really don't have uh, based on my experience. I, I genuinely identify as mixed race, and it's really not enough uh, to give diverse perspectives. So I'm protesting on behalf of the people who are not here. And, and I, uh, so I th now I think that what Piper is doing and this is the objectification, this is where the uh, porpoise gets caught in the tuna net, me being the porpoise. Um, I think that Piper is, uh, has chosen all white panelists, and she chose the panelists. There's no question, she chose the panelists, and the museum has enabled her choice. She has chosen these panels to objectify white people in the way she shows black people being objectified in all of her, in many of her exhibits. And, and what I'm saying is, well, first of all, I'm not sure that, you know, even the tuna should be caught in the nets, okay? And, and wait a second, you know, I, I don't, you, why are you doing this to me as well? I don't think, I'm not sure that anybody should be objectified in the way that she intends based on race, uh, which seems to be what's happening. So I, I kind of get, a, and now there's another thing. It's not a question uh, of what she intends the effects. Our actions have consequences that quite often exceed our initial motivations and intentions. We can't even foresee them. But I'm saying this is what we have as a result uh, of how this was conceptualized as, as conceptual art. And, you know, I, I'm enjoying it, but I'm also resisting it. Yeah, oh, we don't need to harp on this. I just think I still don't fully grasp the account of objectification here. So, I mean, being used means in general. means being treated as an object for observation rather than purely as an agent who has but, as much freedom as the other side that's doing the treating. But I would, you wanted to jump in here or? Uh, was, no, uh, wait, wait, you, you, you carry yeah, on. Yeah, no, I, I mean, on. I guess I think that, you know, the, the problem with objectification is that it disregards agency, right? So somebody is objectified if they're treated in a way that they don't consent to or they're used, but they're merely used, right, to invoke the, the Kantian sense there. But insofar as, you know, our consent and our agency, we're benefiting from this, you know, not only with this conversation, but, you know, in terms of compensation and all that. I think it's, that's where I'm getting caught up with the idea okay, of objectification. Okay, very quickly, very yeah, quickly. Okay. There are people in the third world who sleep in shifts in order to make our smartphones, and they don't make enough money to buy uh, the gadgets themselves. And, and neoliberals often say, yeah, but they choose these jobs. Yeah, they, they choose these jobs, they do, it's true. They're not being kidnapped, they choose these jobs because the situation uh, is a step up or, or seems to be a new opportunity going into it. Does that mean they're not being exploited? No, it doesn't. But, it but means is that a, a choice, it means a choice, it means that Choice does not require perfectionism. I mean, we make a choice given, given what's offered or, or, or we make choices among different ways to spend our time and it doesn't mean the thing you end up with is gonna fulfill your wildest perfectionist dreams. You know, you may choose something uh, with your eyes wide open. Okay, so just one really quick thing, I'll let you get it on this. We could go on this forever probably, but um, it, it seems to me like the the problem with invoking the language of choice in that context is that it is a context of you know, extreme inequality and exploitation and oppression. In other words, it, it seems problematic to invoke that comparison as if we are somehow some similarly positioned to those individuals, right? That's right? just an analogy. I'm not right, saying... Right, but that's, that's what I'm challenging is okay, the analogy, so right? is your is your academic... Well, let me, uh, instead of that interrogating you, let me say, look, my job is not perfect, and you've heard what I've said about philosophers early on, so you must imagine that I've had some experience of that, and yet I choose to continue working in that job. I choose to continue working with those people. Do, do they do these less than morally ideal things to me and to each other and to other people? Yes. The fact that I choose to continue doesn't mean that it, it, that it's fulfilling an ideal. I think you're confusing, I think you're expecting too much of choice. You're thinking that choice, that if you choose something, you must be 
you must be choosing it as the best and the purest. No, it just might be, okay, you got to choose this, you got to choose that, you got to make a living. What else are you going to do if you don't have the job you have and so forth? I, I guess I just think the understanding of objectification is, is far too wide if it's to capture that. But I, again, I <laughs> will have to have a, a, an ongoing discussion about this. Did you want to jump uh, in too? I, I was just going to so I know that you and I disagree about whether we're part of an artwork, so I don't want to rehearse. Who is the you? You, you and I, oh, right? So, yeah. um, so I don't want to rehearse the arguments for and against that. I just want to ask the question, were it the case that we're not in an artwork, right? Uh, or were it the case that philosophy is not the queen of the sciences? That's not, that's not how I think of philosophy. I think that is a, a very particular well, historical... I also write about Locke, yeah. who treats us as under labor. I can right. take either side, but you yeah. know what I mean. Okay, so, so the question is just simply... So there seems to be three components to this. There's the question about... So three components of the way that you're setting up the objectification. There's the issue about whether you're being used as a means in someone else's artwork... Um, there's the issue about one's self-understanding as a philosopher and why that might make one particularly bridal at that. And then there's the third bit, which is the issue of the um, composition of the panel. And so um, I... Yeah. Okay. So I'm just... My question is just, like, I don't know how they aggregate in your picture, but two out of the three of them... I don't share your premise on, so I don't. Which two don't you share? So I don't think we're in an artwork, um, and I don't think philosophy is the queen of the sciences. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get off that. Yeah. We don't have to say it's the queen of the sciences. Yeah. Philosophers have a lot of intellectual autonomy. Yeah. Uh, yeah when yeah. they're analyzing something, yeah. and we're just. So it's just to say, look, if that. So what I what I was trying to avoid is having an argument about whether we're in an artwork. I'm just that, I'm just posing the counterfactual question. Were, were it to turn out that we're not? in an artwork, where it's turned out that these premises aren't fulfilled, would your worry about objectification lapse? That's the question I'm asking. If, we were not a, if we're not in an artwork, yeah. would I worry about objectification? If we were not in an artwork? If we were not in an artwork, I would have a more severe worry uh -huh. about, about the lack of diversity in okay. the panels, right. okay? okay. Uh, the fact that it's an artwork and it has, uh, possibly not fully understood by me, uh, artistic intentions, uh, I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. I don't exactly know what they are. I can't really see how they could be wholeheartedly good, but, you know, benefit of the doubt makes it not as disturbing mm -hmm. as, as right. these panels have been. So if so I thought... If I would not go to a fine... I would not attend an all-white philosophy conference. I'm sorry, but those days... You know, I wouldn't do. I can't think of any reason why I'd be motivated to do that. But if it's an all-white philosophy conference as part of an art exhibit, and and there's some question as as to why that's been done, and I and like I say, I think Piper. The only way this can come out okay is that Piper has has. I'm not saying she started out wanting it to be all white, uh, but she selected certain strains of work that did not require the experience and articulation of racial experience from non-whites, and so she's responsible in that sense for being all white. Um, uh, the fact that, that she, the, on, the only way you can explain that is that she wants to objectify whiteness. I don't okay. know if that's the only way you could explain it though, because it seems- How else can you explain well, it? Well, you could explain it if you think what she's focusing on is the content of the work that these individuals have done and not their identities. Okay, the not, oh please, I mean this is a major discussion and debate within not only philosophy but the national you know, scene right now. I mean, how, when is identity relevant to the content of one's arguments? Is it always relevant? Well, no, I mean oftentimes it is. So if this was a panel on the lived experience of being black in America, you know, I totally agree with you that and the identity, well, that, I guess that's what matters, right? Is to what it, it, well, it it's, a, it's about Piper's work on racial identity and her lived experiences, certainly. And Piper's both. work is. A <laughs> yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. So um, I think this is, a, this is a fascinating discussion and I've been thinking about my own experience. I'm biracial, I'm half black and ha half white, and I've lived and worked in professional environments with all white people. 
um, including a major law firm and just pretty much every space, including universities where I, I am maybe one of a very few people of color. And I think it might be very difficult to understand what that experience is like if you're a white person and you've never lived it. And I'm wondering, that experiment where Adrian had the um, you will lose everything words uh, written on these, everything will be taken away, these subjects, these white subjects, um, in a way, they were objectified, right? Because if you look at the passage that you described where they felt looked at, they felt like objects, they felt like they were dissected. So I think in many ways that's what it's like being a person of color in all white spaces. And in that regard, Naomi, you are objectified because you're illustrating that point. You're, if you're the only person of color on these panels, you are objectified. <laughs> right. So, so it's perfectly so maybe maybe Piper was prescient. You know, maybe she's uh, listening in on all this. Hi, Adrian, uh, from um, uh, Berlin, and and maybe she realized that well, if I include if I include Naomi Zach, she'll she'll see this and say something about it, and therefore my integrity as an artist on working on race will be preserved. I don't know. Um, if if I didn't if it was it's important again it's important to me uh, that this is part of an artwork because as I said if it wasn't I wouldn't be I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have accepted it's not a question of reluctance it just would not have been ac uh, acceptable but but Rebecca's argument misses why inclusiveness is important it's not important to distribute the goodies. It's not important so you have uh, agreeable optics, you know, with lots of human variety. It's important because in the United States, people of color have different life experiences than white people. And, and if you're doing a show on racial life in America, which is another broad category that this could fall under, then how can you do that if the people commenting on the show have only had one kind of racial experience. So, 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 the, so the only way you can do that is if they're really just part of the show, you know, the, the, except you've got one person maybe who's going to point out their experience of what's going on. I really don't know. But, but this idea that you choose people because they're qualified and race is not relevant in all contexts, that might be correct in some contexts. Uh, maybe higher mathematics or some very dry context, but it's not relevant if the subject is race. <laughs> That's it. No, I I appreciate that, and I you know I think that those are really important comments. But you know what I was trying to point to also is the fact that you know I think Piper and all of us are reckoning with the injustice of the white academy, right? I mean, it's increasingly you know, being diversified, but as you noted, you know, we're far off the mark, especially in philosophy, where it's still extremely white. And so, in, in other words, I guess this is a question, too, about exactly where to attribute responsibility, because I, I think that, you know, if Piper was drawn to particular, you know, interventions into her work, like that of Jarmud and myself and yourself, you know, she could very well acknowledge that, you know, she's lacking the optics, but perhaps grant that that is exactly one symptom of the ongoing racism that shapes the academic world. And that's, right? Okay. Like, uh, then, yeah. then this is part of an artwork. Uh, uh, uh -huh. it, if it was a real <laughs> philosophy panel, yeah. she, she would have had to have people of color, especially African Americans, participating yeah. Not just one token mixed race person such as myself. But I think okay, right. <laughs> I'm sorry. But you know, I, yeah, I, it's more than I can take on to represent all that. But, but yeah, yeah. Let's. All right. Sorry. Sorry. We have more. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm just an ordinary person. I'm not, not that deep or anything. But what I saw in the presentation, I saw that uh, Piper had a lot of issues. And she's expressing that in her art, her artwork. And it goes from, I got that it came it first from a child on why I have to explain myself or who I am 
whether I'm half white, half black, or maybe I want to be white today, maybe I want to be black next week. I think she had an issue with her own self and her own problems and where she wanted to place herself. Now, I think it's very clever that she, expressing, she is expressing it through art and through this big book that she wrote <laughs> and has the college people and everybody <laughs> trying to undo and untwist her, her problem, yeah. which is, I think it's very centered in her. The part where she had her hair hinted, tainted, yeah. with, you know, paint, you brought that point out. Yeah. I saw she expressed, for me, there was like an edge of anger mm -hmm. over here in her yeah. eyes and her mouth. That tint was like an anger, subtle, it's, she's like sizzling all the time, like I'm walking in and who am I gonna have to explain myself to today? Because I'm a black African-American woman, you wake up every morning, all my life, you know that you're an African-American person and here I go out today. And it can be pleasant however I choose to make that be pleasant because I'm just a human being. I'm an American and I'm a human being. But I think it's very clever how Pepper, I mean Piper, decided to express herself through this art, a person to me that really has some deep issues about who she is. Yeah, that's, that's I think when art succeeds, but you know, I'm, I'm, I meant to say something about the henna. Her teeth are also red or orange and the whites of her eyes are kind of orange. So I think it's not necessarily henna, I think it's a filter. And I think if you look at the colors, uh, it starts out with, with a very dark brown and then there's red, and then there's yellow. So it's sort of like, on, it's like a fire. You know, the, the, the yellow hair is, are, are, is like the flames. But, but it's not necessarily henna, uh, because if it was henna, I doubt she would have put henna on her teeth. She might have, but there's no way you can put henna on the whites of your eyes, you know. So, so can I just say one thing in re reply to that? So. Um, I had a quote that somehow I didn't read out, but it speaks to exactly the thing you've raised, the question whether it's Piper who has a problem or the world that has a problem with Piper, right? So Piper certainly thinks it's the world that has a problem with Piper. She says this, she says, up to that point by which she means adolescence, I had felt invisible to the naked eye, not absent, not ignored, quite the contrary. It was just that what I received attention for had nothing to do with the way I looked. Feeling invisible was the same as feeling invulnerable, encouraged by my parents always to ally with the invisible but unconquerable forces of reason. So the, the thing that I think runs through a lot of Piper's work is the fact that you know, Piper is just Piper, and it's like all these people have a problem with what it is to be Piper, and they make it her problem, right? So um, she is by her own account, you know, difficult and demanding. So that's that's true, but I think on this specific issue, like about how she identifies and people's inability to tolerate how she identifies is what she she at least perceives it as them making their problem her business, right? Um, so that, that might just, I don't know, just in terms of what you, you said. So I, I will say I came to this event knowing that it was an array of philosophers and you all are you know, panel experts on the topic of race and black relations. But I will say, um, listening to each one of you, I did notice a distinct difference in like um, your expertise is um, in comparison with Naomi Zacks because um, I know you all are experts on the topic, but for Naomi, it seemed to be like more of a quotation expert, as in like a, a living subject on the topic of race, because you do have the unique perspective of being of mixed. I'm know, also race. older than they are, so uh, I've I have guess, more time. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because I have I have not been able to see um, Adrian Piper's exhibition, but I will take each one of your perspectives in my mind, I will think of this beyond race, but I will say on all of your perspectives, 
of race that Naomi Zaks did s distinctly seem as more of a living subject exposition as opposed to just expert you know, um, opinion. You see, that's why there should have been more diversity on the panel. You know, no, no, no insult or slight meant, uh, right. I mean, the, the, I will say one small thing, which is just, it may not be obvious in this context. So how one can feel disenfranchised has a lot to do with local context, right? So in Britain, class functions in the way that race functions in the States. It's the thing that, you know, completely hobbles people's prospects, right? So. Um, you can be in Britain working class in an academic environment and suffer very similar phenomena because you are totally anomalous in that environment. So um, there's all sorts of axes along which one can be in these positions of subordination. Um, and some of those are uh, geographically specific. Well, you know, I have some experience. I lived in, in London actually for four years back uh, in the 70s, uh, and I've had close relationships uh, uh, with English people. It's uh, class is not quite the same. Cla uh, uh, cl the class system uh, is is uh, a very um, it, it creates hierarchies in all kinds of places. But you know, there's also a system of race uh, in, in England. So you, the, the point is that if you're going to take it upon yourself to per to have an exhibition and comment on an exhibition that's about race in the United States, you, it's not enough just to point out that it might be different or uh, from race in the UK or it might be like class in the UK. You know, you, ha you have to have an open mind as to not just what the artist says, but what's going on in the world. I mean, this country at this time is, is being torn apart uh, because of a recrudescence of 19th century ideas about race. I mean, forget about the, the, the kinds of academic uh, discrimination that Piper was talking about, the kind of polite racism. I mean, you know, it was preceded by a whole series of, of shootings, of, uh, which are still going on, but they've been eclipsed by other acts of violence. We also have a resurgence of anti-Semitism uh, uh, occurring here. So, so there, there really is no apt comparison uh, in, in such turbulent situations, if you really want to understand a turbulent situation, if you have the time and energy to do that, you have to learn something about that situation. You know, again, I mean, I don't mean this uh, uh, in, in a strongly critical way. I'm just saying that uh, this show is interesting at this time because of, uh, of heightened uh, tensions and violence that swirl around issues of race and ethnicity, and we're not getting that f from the show itself. Uh, so the, the, the public deserves more from the institution of high art. I also think, though, that sometimes there are some presumptions about what we all bring to the table as far as identity is concerned. So people assumed this was an all-white panel. You know, they didn't know that you were actually of mixed race. You mentioned anti-Semitism. I'm not inclined to, you know, invoke my identity, identity as a Jewish person from a family of Holocaust survivors precisely because I'm critical of some of the ways that we assume identity informs the claims we make. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And when I was attacked last year for writing my article and Numerous people said to me, you should have said you were Jewish in your article. Some people were upset that you brought up the example of Jewish conversion. You should have said that. And my response is, but it's not relevant is the thing for me. And sometimes we, I think, dangerously assume, uh, you know, things about people's embodiments as people were assuming about, about you, assuming this was an all white panel or, you know, assuming the way that identity is relevant. Now, I'm not denying that identity is, is incredibly relevant um, to many of the claims and arguments that folks make. And I agree with you that, you know, had there been, uh, you know, more racially diverse set of panelists, we would have, you know, uh, a different and valuable set of perspectives. But I also think that this is precisely the kind of dialogue that Piper is, is trying to encourage us to have, right? That, that, in, that the fact that this whole conversation has been one about the diversity or lack thereof of the panels is exactly 
the kind of thing that she's, you know, um, critiquing as far as like the, 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 the tendency to kind of hyper focus on visible identities, right? Now, so I think you can both acknowledge the importance of diversifying and li lifting up, you know, the voices of the marginalized while also acknowledging that she is trying to pose that very question too. Okay. Anyway, yeah. But again, I mean, all I can say is it's not a question of appearances, it's a question of experience. Can I interject so, one thing? Yeah. I feel like the thing that's being missed in this discussion is the word pass. Passing. You're denying something yeah. or masking something so that you can have some privilege. And I think mm. part of the installation is about the perceived uh. superiority of being white and mm. then having to deny having some blackness uh. in order to experience that. So the whole notion of passing, it's like passing black, passing white. The lady who did the NAACP thing, she passed for black because she perceived there was some benefit for that. And for the people that are of mixed race, they're denying their black to experience some white privilege, but there's that whole construct no, no, within no, no. that. I'm not, I'm not denying I'm black to experience white privilege. I'm not saying you are, I'm saying, but the historically that's what was historically done. Historically within the black, yeah, that was done. But the reason that I'm of mixed race is I was raised by a Jewish mother in New York City uh, and did not grow up with, with the kind of proper immersion in a black community that somebody who identifies as black would require, okay? So, so I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not, you can't say that I'm benefiting for, 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 uh, uh, by, by uh, basing an identity on events that, that I had no control over. In other words, I'm not, uh, I don't get anything from, from saying that I mix race instead of black. I mean, actually, I would get more if I could wholeheartedly identify as black because then all many, many institutions and places of higher learning would be more comfortable with me than somebody who had a solid African-American identity and then they could claim the fruits of diversity. So I'm not really gaining anything by insisting on a mixed race identity. Could, hi. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so I really liked the, um, what's it called, uh, uh, everything will be taken away. Um, I thought that that was really interesting because that brought for me, um, going back to Du Bois' double consciousness, because as if Piper was kind of redirecting the double consciousness on white people, if that makes sense, because I mean, it, it's backwards. Right. And so therefore you're looking at those words and y y I mean, so white people are looking at themselves like, oh, this is what double consciousness feels like. Um, Cause it's um, kind of like, oh, what's his name? Um, uh, Roland Barthes talks about the death of the author in terms of artwork. So it's like, where it's not that the author has the intention uh, I mean, um, it's not what the author's saying, but it's what you get to say about the artwork. So that's what's happening in terms of that, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, so, yeah, so I just, thought that, I just thought that that was really, really cool, like the way she did that. Yeah. 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 I, I, oh, I'm sorry, did you want to No, no. I just noticed that this person's ha hand up has been up in the box. Can I, can I say one small thing about that, that work? Um, so one of the things that I think is very rich about the work, which I didn't talk about at all, is how context sensitive and how rich that legend is. I mean, imagine that you are cheating on your wife. Imagine that you're on death row. Imagine that you are um, volunteering in prisons. Imagine that you're at the barber shop, right? I mean, it can go from the sublime to the ridiculous. I mean, that could mean a whole lot of things for different people in different contexts. And so it's, it's, there's the general fact of this double consciousness you mentioned, then there's the specific fact about whatever that individual may fear being taken away. Um, and that's part of its richness, I think, as a work. I just throwing that in since yeah. I didn't say it. Um, I'm very persuaded by Professor Zach's argument that there is an objectification in this moment, in this presentation, and in this 
racial dialogue which has very loud white voices and are very well articulated voices. I'm struck that, you know, some people are seeing the authenticity in the mixed race voice on the panel and I think that's because we don't see the racialized nature of all of the speakers because of the invisibility of white privilege and so on. But I think it's particularly um, racialized to frame Adrian Piper's work in a, in a way that situates it in the tradition of, of Kant and of a kind of categorical understand a category mistake. It's super white to do that as a white philosopher, just saying that's what it looks like to me. Yeah, so I think you just you just have to go and read the work and then tell me whether you still think that. So yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> I mean I'm not it's not that I'm attributing this to her. It's four hundred and fifty pages of volume two, right? Um, okay, we'll take this last question, but then maybe you guys could do a little wrap up and each fi finish. It's fast because it's almost it's almost more of a comment. Um, you mentioned that this was being turned into some kind of discussion about uh, the panelists all being all white. I would just ask you: Can you imagine a conference, a symposium on Judaism or Jewishness? with no Jewish participants. But it is, a, it is a panel about racial identity. And what I would, so if there were non-Jews who had been you know, writing things that were really about Judaism and Jewish identity, and I thought that their writing was relevant to the panel's topic, then it would not offend me. Um, if I thought that there was a deliberate effort to exclude Jewish voices, then that would be a different story, right? Um, so that's what I would say. I think we're at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your questions. Yeah. Thank you.